and uh, from the viewing public. Uh, we have a special meeting today of Committee of the Whole. That's our strategic planning session. And uh, from there, I'm going to go to our Madam Clerk for roll call. Thank you, Mr. Warden. We have all members of council here with the exception of Councilor Gamble. Okay, will he be joining us later or no? I'm not aware that he is uh, joining us, but I will let you know when he does. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, so we do have a, a published agenda that was uh, published on our calendar. And uh, so is there a declaration of, of interest uh, with any uh, council members today? And, and uh, as we get the information coming out, if something does arise, you can declare at that time if something does, does appear to be an interest. At this time, so the next item is uh, the contacts and the strategic questions update. And I know, uh, Madam CEO, you, you sent out some questions uh, yesterday, I think yeah. it was. Yes. And uh, so I'm going to pass it over to you now. Madam thank CEO. you very, thank you very much, Mr. Ward. And I'm just going to share my screen. R and this. Now, have I got that correct, Rob, or do I need to do something more? You go into view. I think you can make it full screen, so it's just okay. a little bit larger. Okay, that would be good. No, there it is. Okay, there. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, Again, Madam I Madam yes. CEO, I think that, that was taken this weekend. Isn't it beautiful? It is. <laughs> yes. I don't, I don't know who's responsible for the picture, but it is a lovely photo of our beautiful place. So I wanted to start off by thanking everyone for making time to be part of today's discussion. Um, when Warden McQueen requested that we have a strategy, strategy session, you know, as the, the senior team, we thought about that and, you know, given all of the initiatives that we have in motion and planned, uh, the added complexities that COVID-19 has brought to our operations and this, you know, what seems to be such a short, you know, 18 to 24 month window for this council, it seemed like a wonderful opportunity to pause, assess and confirm that we're all aligned as we move forward. So I, sh I did share that deck uh, in an email a few minutes ago. And um, so I'll go through the, the slides with you now. Because this will form part of the um, published report back to Council in the future, there's some um, slides here at the beginning that are really just contextual um, for the public uh, going forward in the future. So we talk about the, the county services and, and how the county structured. Um, you know, these are the really the, the key services the county provides. But I think what we're going to see today is just how broad um, the county's uh, services have become or are becoming as, as we move forward. Our vision, purpose, and values, these have been in place for a number of years. Um, I think they still serve us well, but certainly if, if people wanted to make any comments or adjustments to any of those things, um, we're very open to that. Um, as far as our agenda today goes, um, we're going to do three things. We're going to consider some strategic questions. We're going to review the priority projects that we have underway, and then to think about next steps and whether there are adjustments required to our plans and timelines. So to help us to consider some of these critical questions with respect to the three goals in our strategic plan, I'm really pleased to introduce our facilitator for this morning, Rebecca Southerns. And um, Rebecca is the founder and CEO of uh, Sage Solutions, an independent consulting firm based out of Guelph. Um, as well as being a certified professional facilitator, Rebecca has a PhD in rural studies and a master's in public administration. Um, she's worked with Gray County departments in the past to great success and really, really delighted to have her with us this morning. So I will move to the next slide and I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks very much, Kim. I appreciate that. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, really a pleasure to be with you today and uh, really do appreciate the opportunity um, as Kim said, my, my background is facilitating strategic planning with community organizations. So I work with local governments a lot. 
um, local and regional governments. I work with um, universities, health organizations, and medium to large nonprofits. Just about starting year 25 of doing that and um, have a good solid experience, set of experience across both rural and urban municipalities. So um, really grateful to be um, working with Gray County today and uh, continuing that conversation. As Kim said, I've been with various pieces of your uh, administrative puzzle, but not with all of you. So it's nice to put some faces to names. Um, we have three hours together today. And um, so the big arc of the day or the session will be that we have um, th these three questions to consider um, together. And we also have basically a project list to review. And ballpark, I think we're looking at one third of the time will be um, the questions and two thirds of the time will be the project list. But I'd like to be pretty flexible with that depending on the conversation. Um, my hope is that we can um, stay really focused in the conversations. And I recognize we've got a big group of us today and I do very much want to hear from people. So one of the things that we'll be doing to facilitate that is using the chat function in Zoom because that lets lots of people answer a question all at once rather than us having to hear from only one person at a time and everybody else has to sit quietly waiting their turn or perhaps not getting a turn. So if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, I'm not gonna use all kinds of features today, but, but the chat feature especially is important. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen. It says chat and it looks like a speech bubble. And um, in there, you can, you can type things. So there will be times when I ask you questions and would love to get your feedback in the chat and then there's other times where I'll say, let's do this one out loud and we'll take time for maybe three or four comments on a, on a given question. Um, and what we'll do is we'll take a couple of breaks during the three hours, a short one and a longer one. Um, and the longer one partly to give us a bit of a break from the screen, but also um, it'll give you a bit of time to read through the project list that came to you earlier this morning in preparation for that final segment of the meeting today, because I do want you to have a chance to um, read through some of that stuff. So we'll probably take a, you know, 10 or 15 minute break the second time and maybe only 10 minutes, five or 10 minutes the, the first time, just so you know what to expect. Um, as Kim said, the, you've got, you know, officially on a calendar, 24 months left in your term, as you well know, in real life, probably slightly less than that once we start talking about things shutting down for campaign season. So we've probably got 18 months of uh, your sort of active term left in real life in the midst of, in some ways, the world having turned upside down and in other ways, things haven't changed perhaps in your area all that much. I was talking with, um, I was working with a feed company uh, last week and they said, you know, animals still need to be fed. Our life has not changed very much. And then another client I was with the next day said, you know, nothing is familiar to me that that was six months ago. So, um, and I'm sure that there's a variety of experience in this room and across your constituencies for sure. Um, so before we launch into the questions, I really wanted to frame our conversation today in a couple of ways. One is to say, really to frame it in, in the bigger question of can we plan at a time like this? Um, it feels a bit counterintuitive um, because things are so uncertain to think about mapping a, a plan or charting a course. And admittedly, my business has gotten very busy as people are saying, oh geez, you know, the strategy we set even last year seems irrelevant now. So we need a new plan because the context has changed so much. And yet we're doing it in the context of a ton of uncertainty where people think, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, see three weeks ahead of us where, you know, let alone three years. So in some ways, I'm rather grateful that our conversation today has kind of this 18 to 24 month time frame because in a strategic planning kind of world, that's a really short time frame. Um, and it's not, I'm thinking of it more as a, as a prioritization exercise really, um, because not only is the time frame short, it's also, you have a lot of work underway. It's not, we're not starting with a bank, blank slate today saying, so what do you wanna do for the next couple of years? This is, there's lots of things happening are we understanding that mix of priorities in the same way? Which ones would you deem urgent? Are there ones that need to kind of be moved a little bit farther down the priority list in favor of other ones that are emerging because of the changed context? It's that kind of check-in meeting. Um, and I think it's really important that we do it now, partly because everything in the context is different and therefore if a strategy responds to context, as the context changes, we need to change our strategy or at least make sure it's still solid. 
Um, it also gives a council focus and gets everyone kind of on the same page, even if politically you come from different places, at least if we have a shared work plan, you know what to expect when different decisions come up. You can say, oh yeah, I remember that was on the urgent and important list. Um, or if something new comes up, you have a sense of, are we willing to follow this new next shiny thing? And if so, what needs to come off the list in order for that to happen? So a sense of um, choices and trade-offs I think is really important. Um, and I think there's just lots of other reasons why, um, why planning at a time like this is quite important. Um, I, we, I just had a, a chapter in a book come out last week that it was, came out of Australia primarily. And if you'll excuse the, the title, it's called What the Hell Do We Do Now? And in it, I, I've got a chapter called Can We Plan at a Time Like This? And it was interesting. I just got the hard copy of the book yesterday and I was flipping through it last night. And it really does give you a sense of everything has changed and yet there's some key things that haven't changed. And when I look at the list of responsibilities that the county has, Many of those have not changed at all. I mean, snow still needs to be removed, garbage still needs to be handled, right? You've got, there are lots of other kinds of businesses that have changed way more than yours. And yet I would imagine that there are lots of things that have shifted in your world. And I think the other reason that the question of can we plan at a time like this is important is um, with an emphasis, not so much on planning, but an emphasis on the we part, can we plan at a time like this? And I think the other piece that I'd like to have kind of front of mind for us is that everyone we are dealing with right now, including those of us around this table, if we were at a table, uh, is stressed. The, the, the chronic um, stress level, the sort of baseline stress level has, has bumped up. And so there's this sort of underlying, sometimes more than underlying, layer of um, uncertainty that is causing a lot of, um, of stress for people, even if your business is going well, even if things are fine, even if your kids have settled well into school or your grandkids have, there's this, um, this sense of stress. And we know neurologically that people don't make their best decisions under stress, right? And we, we know this at all kinds of levels and layers, but we've been dealing right now with an acute level of stress, kind of that fight or flight thing, over a chronic length of time. And that makes us humanly challenged. We're not good at this level of adrenaline over a long period of time. And you may have seen this in your county where you did some things early on in the pandemic thinking it was short and then it's continued, right? And now that's the other reason we need to plan now is going, oh, it's really hard to run a race that you don't know how long it is. So you pace yourself differently for a sprint than a marathon. Hmm, this seems a little more marathon-like than we thought time to adjust our pace and but also to acknowledge that we all collectively and individually may not be at our best right now lots of people are tired lots of people are stressed lots of people are um irritable uh, i don't know if you're noticing this but there's a crankiness you know that is making us um not amazing right at the moment so as much as I, as a planner, am of course going to say strategy is important, I also want to acknowledge that the reason we do it together, in addition to it being, you know, an appropriate thing at a county level to do, is that we need one another's um, wisdom to offset our own blind spots and also to offset the fact that some of us on any given day might not be functioning on all cylinders. So um, that's the kind of thinking that I'm bringing to this process because what I am interested in is collaborative strategic planning because even as, well, maybe especially as a council, um, the more you can get on the same page with one another and with your senior staff, the more effective you're going to be. So there's an alignment piece that I'm usually looking for that comes also from a commitment to two things. One is to reduce blind spots. We each have a different perspective on this um, set of priorities and we'd like to hear that. And the other is to build buy-in so that as a group, you can be ambassadors for this county, not only that, but also for the, the individual plans of the county with some measure of unif unified voice in each of your municipalities and certainly around this council ring. So um, I'm ready to dive into the content of this, but I did want to frame it with a few of those comments and, and would like to open it to you um, if you want to respond to any of that, ask any questions affirm or question anything that I just said, we can certainly take five minutes to do so. I would just need you to unmute, unmute your mic and uh, dive in if you want to. Any comments at all on that framing? 
Any comments from County Council? Rebecca, I like your, your, your analogy about reduce the blind spots. That's so true, I think. Just yeah. to, because we all, you know, there's always three sides to every story, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I love having lots of perspectives on the same thing to go, oh, hadn't thought of that. And I think that's a really important reason why we do this together and why Kim and her team don't just sit and do it in their own offices, right? Right. Any quick comments from county councilors out there? Ready to dive in? Sounds All right. like it. Let's do it. Um, you'll notice that I talk quickly and I process information really fast. And if I'm going too quickly, you're welcome to say slow down because I, I go, oh, we've got three hours to do a bucket load of stuff and I'll just go. And if I'm leaving you in my desk by mistake, you're welcome to wave at me and go, can you stop? So I will, uh, the only reason you need breaks is that nobody wants to listen to me talk for three hours. So, um, but I, I do know that I can move pretty fast. So if it's too much, do say so. Um, my understanding is that you have a strategic plan in place already that has three main pillars. And so what we've done is we've got three questions to address um, initially, and they align with each of those pillars. And where those questions have come from is this. We want to make sure that the priorities of the strategy that you currently have are top of mind for you. We are not looking for, as I said, a start from scratch strategy today we're working within the pillars that you already have. And the questions have come from um, senior staff saying, there's some things that we need to know from council to be able to help us set priorities and to know what to bring, in, bring forward to council. So um, that's where these came from. And so we have some time to dig into these because they're big questions and um, so what I'd like to be able to do is to um, give you a way, kind of tease them apart and give you a sense of, um, give, for you to give your staff really a sense of guidance so that as they move, make their work plans and move things forward, they'll know how to prioritize things. Because what's gonna happen is that the answers we come up with, with to these three questions will then shape the lenses we use to look at the project list that is coming in the second half of the meeting. So I'd love to have a conversation first, and you'll see it in the slide deck there, about your sense right now of the capacity of the public to accept further tax increases. And I realize that this is sort of a politicized question, isn't it? Um, I get that. But I also think that it's really important for a county council to be sort of to gather intel, right? You have sort of, you have relationships and um, connections all through the county. And we'd like to know what you're hearing and what your sense is of people's willingness at this point to see a levy increase or not, and to what extent. Um, and admittedly, having asked a similar kind of question across other municipalities in the last month, this question is getting answered in every possible different way. So I don't believe that there's a, a clear right answer to this. Please don't think we're fishing for that, nor are we looking for you to sort of obediently align, line up along your you know, preferred political stripes necessarily, this is a time to say, what are you hearing? Because there are people that want to lean in and say, this is a time to invest. You know, it's really a time to spend our way out of this. And we have to lean in and invest in, in a lot. And there's other people that are saying, not a chance. People are struggling economically. They don't have two cents to rub together right now. The last thing they want to be doing is paying more taxes and everything in between. So that's my question, but I want to start with an earlier one or add another one, which is, and how do you know? Because I'd love to hear the kind of evidence that you have, even if it's intuitive or, you know, a conversation at your local coffee shop, if you ever go there anymore. Um, how, how do you know that what you say has some, some reason to be weighed in? Because if you just sort of come out with a position, we need a way to say, what are you taking into consideration when you, when you make that point? So I'd ask you to answer the question in those two ways. What's your sense of an appetite for a levy increase and how much and how do you know? And we've got a good, you know, probably mm, less than half an hour, but more than 20 minutes to talk about this. So um, let's dig in and, um, and I'll be taking notes of it as we go along. It is also being recorded and we'll be capturing this and, and using it uh, moving forward. So please go ahead. Who would like to start us off? 
So just for clarity, Rebecca, are you wanting this through uh, the chat part or do you want it verbally at this point? Thanks for asking. Um, let, I was thinking verbally, but I do want to say this. You, if you have something that you want to say and you're like, I am not going to get a turn. We're going to run out of time. You can always be putting things in the chat. Unlike in person, the chat is not like an inappropriate side conversation. The chat is extra richness to our conversation and I don't find it rude at all. So lots in the chat, even as we're talking verbally. And I would ask each individual counselor to keep your comments brief so that we can get a turn from, if not everyone, then certainly most of council in the next 20 minutes or so, please. Um, Councillor Klumpus, go ahead. I think Councillor Soever was maybe ahead of her. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry, I missed, I missed that. Can I, can we go, yeah. to, I was looking at the chat and hand. Yeah. So, <laughs> my yes. apologies. So, um, great. Can we, sorry, can we go to Councillor Soever first and then Councillor Klumpus, my apologies. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, um, I think that's a very good question on tax increases, but we don't really spend too much time on revenue. When you look at our budget documents, uh, they're all focused on costs. And in general, county spends hours on their budget rather than days at the local level. So there's a very poor understanding, I think, at the county level on how taxation works and actually what people actually do pay. So we've done some analysis here at the, the town of Blue Mountains and, you know, right now people in uh, Meaford, Owen Sound in the Blue Mountains are spending about $600 for every $10,000 of household income on taxes, property taxes. But it gets a little more confusing than that when you start looking at, um, how much is retained at the local level? Of that $600 that uh, people pay um, total out of, for every $10,000 of after-tax household income. So that's 6% of their total after-tax income is going toward property taxes. Um, you know, Owen Sound keeps about $420 of that. Meaford keeps about $350 and the Blue Mountains keeps about $240. So um, it's, it's a substantial amount, but it's not evenly distributed over throughout the county um, because the county taxes range from a low of about $110 in Hanover for $10,000 of household income to a high of $229 in the town of Blue Mountains. So, there's a lot of numbers, but what it shows is there's a disparity and you're really dealing with two levels of government. So how much is left for the local municipality after the county and the school board get done with our taxpayers? Um, you know, it, it's a big question. And, and so we all get the same county services, but we pay a hugely different, even when you factor in income, we pay a hugely different amount of county taxes in terms of relative to the, the household income. So I think it's something we need to focus on. Certainly our Ratepayers Association has been very active. Kim will know that. Um. Councilor so I'm gonna interrupt you just for a sec for two reasons. One is that yes. we need to keep our comments brief. And the other reason is because given that context, and we're not gonna solve any of that problem today, no. um, what I am willing to say is, do we need to put that conversation into a strategy that says we have to work on that, but today's not the day to solve that. So what I'd love to hear though, is given all of that context that you just described, which I found really helpful, would you see there being any appetite at all for an increase in that levy or not? And if so, no. what's your sense? No, but we have to understand it. So we should yeah. devote more time to the, um, to the revenue side of the budget. Right now we spend an inordinate amount of time on the spending side the cost, but we don't look at where our revenue is coming from and the impact that it does have on our taxpayers. And I think we need to focus on that and to, ex to understand, you know, what is the capacity and explain that capacity to the people that are paying the bills. Absolutely, thanks for that. And that reminds me that one of the other sort of quick numbers that it's probably helpful for council to have in mind today is that when you see some prices on things later on, big numbers, right? Um, 
a 1% county tax levy increase equals about $600,000. Okay, so as we're looking at things that cost money, 1% equals 600 grand, ballpark. Okay, just so you have that number in your head. Thanks for that, Councillor Silver. Councillor Klump is over to you. Thank you so much and, uh, and welcome. Thanks for your initial presentation, Rebecca. It was very good. Um, I just wanted to say that in our community, we're just going into our draft budget on Monday and it appears that we're looking at uh, from the lower tier about an 8.6% increase um, and it is all due to uncontrollable costs. There are no enhancements in that, uh, in that uh, budget increase, and it is all due to uh, things like uh, policing, um, all of those uncontrollable costs that we have no influence over. So in keeping it with that, uh, and traditionally the county level, uh, levy rather, has uh, mitigated those increases to the lower level um, in the past, and we've certainly appreciated that at the time when we were into double digit increases at the lower level uh, many years ago, um, that uh, uh, reduced or lower county level certainly helped us get through. Um, but in terms of uh, the uh, residents' um, impact to the residents on their taxes, I would have to say no. Um, um, and it's for that reason, when we have no increases in, in services, no increase, no enhancements, um, we are going to be looking at um, reducing services if uh, we don't, uh, to, to mitigate that 8.6% increase in uh, uncontrollable costs. Terrific. Thank you. For that. Appreciate that. Um, who else would like to comment on this? You can wave your hand at me or you can go in the participant list and raise your hand or you can type in the chat, whatever you want. I see Councillor Potter. Thanks, Councillor Potter, go ahead. Yeah, I did put it in the, in the chat. And just, uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I think the capacity to accept tax increases is pretty low, uh, but I think what people are more worried about is the priorities. Where are we spending their money? Um, this is not a time for, for frills and extras. Uh, there is an appetite for, uh, you mentioned spending our way out of it. I don't think it's so much that as it's a time that we can invest in projects to, uh, to keep the money flowing, but not on, not on excesses. Um, we did not lay anybody off during the, the pandemic. We kept everything moving um, and we have not, what we've heard from the public is they're quite happy about that. We kept delivering services and nobody's complained, well, gee, I could have saved some tax money. What they've been happy about is that uh, people are still employed. They understand that those people would be receiving benefits anyway, so, so that wouldn't help. Um, but what they do want to see is, is us realign our priorities to what we are going to face next year. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Desai. Desai, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, just, I just want to make a few comments uh, with regards to the question on taxation. Um, uh, county councillors and staff know that I've, I've been um, fairly pro, uh, pro taxation in the sense of um, Using using our tax revenue to to invest, and I haven't been shy in saying that maybe we should be increasing um, our tax levy. Um, the the problem uh, that I see is that our 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 entire budget is based around service delivery. Uh, we do not sell a product; we we provide services, um, and services cost money. And so if we do not increase taxation, how do we provide those services uh, without, the, without the revenue that comes in uh, that we then spend to provide those services? Because the cost of providing the services we provide today uh, will increase tomorrow. Uh, cost of services keeps increasing year on year. Um, the second, Councillor Sever made a comment on the fact that we focus a lot on the cost rather than revenue. 
Um, unfortunately, we only have one source of revenue. Uh, we only have um, the, the property uh, taxes that we, we can collect as our revenue source. We don't have much in the way of uh, uh, diversification there. So really the only place where we can do anything is on service provision and the cost of service provision. Um, in terms of taxes, uh, increasing the taxes, I mean, I would like to see uh, us increasing the levy if we can uh, invest it towards providing services that we don't necessarily need today, but services that can attract people to our community uh, tomorrow. Because I think uh, the one way to increase our revenue is to bring more people into our communities. It's one way to make our uh, our transit routes uh, more sustainable and um, and more revenue generating. So if we can spend money this year to bring more people in uh, uh, next year, I think I think that money well 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 used. Um, um, so yeah, I, I I haven't had the conversation. Uh, to be quite frank, around um, uh, levy increases yet, uh, since we haven't really gotten into budget discussions in Grey Highlands. Um, but in in my personal opinion, I think if if we can if we increase the levy this year with with the goal of investing it so that we will see dividends on it two years, three years, four, five years down the road, it'll be uh, money well well spent. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And I do see the comment, I see the comments from Councillor Patterson and Milne in the chat. And I see right now that we have, I've got three people lined up to talk and I'd like to pause at that point and regroup and see if we're gonna move on or stay on this topic. So let's hear from Councillor Robinson and then it'll be followed by Councillors O'Leary and Body. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much uh, for having this discussion. I think it's really important. And to you, Rebecca, I, it, what really resonated with me is uh, your statement about collaborative decision making and uh, this certainly is a, a very good example of that. So just to quickly get back to the question, um, I'm hearing a, a small range if you will. So a modest increase in taxes all the way down to no increase at all and for various reasons and they certainly come from citizens and, and business owners. Um, how am I hearing this? face-to-face, -face, certainly through um, public health protocols, but by phone and by email. Um, what resonates with me as well is with a um, modest increase that there is something tangible that can be identified by our taxpayers. So uh, if there's a big project and there is the associated uh, levy increase to uh, residents, they're seeing that, to business um, individuals, uh, economic sector individuals, they are identifying with that. Um, I think that is, oh, just one other point, if I might. Uh, if you look at the other two questions that you're asking uh, on item two and three, it ties into levy increase. So how can we enhance the vitality and the, um, uh, the infrastructure of our uh, Gray County? And that certainly is uh, through that, that support through the levy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Robinson. Appreciate that. Um, over to Councillor O'Leary. Thanks, Rebecca. I, I, just to comment, um, I want to agree with Councillor Potter. I think it's all about priorities. I think if we raise the the uh, taxes a full percentage point for affordable housing and attainable housing, most common sense people will understand that is money going to help the most vulnerable. If you raise it a percentage point for you know, more festivals in Gray County than not so much. That's my comment. Thanks for that. Over to Councillor Body. Yeah, th thank you. Um, I heard from a restaurant owner recently that's having trouble uh, keeping the doors open. They're hanging on by their fingernails and they got whacked with a 30% tax, or sorry, uh, insurance increase. I know uh, Meaford's got whacked with a big uh, garbage waste uh, disposal uh, increase we're getting hit with about a 30% uh, insurance increase in Owen Sound. So I think we're gonna get whacked with some, uh, as Barb said, with some increases that we don't control. And uh, we've got businesses, commercial certainly pays a slightly higher rate than residential, uh, industrial. They're holding on right now with COVID, with uh, lack of business, not knowing what's going to go on in the next year. 
Um, if you're running tables and at only 50% of your capacity, it hurts. So I, I don't think there's a, uh, an ability to pay an increase right now. On the other hand, we're certainly seeing some of the highest prices we've ever seen paid for housing in this area. Is it uh, disposable income? Is it uh, mortgaging a little bit more? Is it strictly um, external investment into Gray County where people working locally on local incomes can't afford to uh, buy those houses? Um, I think we've got to be really careful and I don't think there's, well, I don't think there's ever a desire to increase taxes, but is there a capacity? I would say not at the moment. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm seeing Councillor Hicks putting in about a 0% tax increase there in terms of uh, being, a, being irresponsible. Um, so, sorry, Councillor Hicks, can I ask you to speak to that? Because I want to make sure I'm understanding the context of what you're saying. Do you mind adding some other um, sentences around it so I get it? So yes, I'm happy to, I guess. Uh, I, I'm looking at the, the infrastructure issue that we have across the province, quite frankly, but just about every municipality. And I think it's irresponsible for, uh, for governments to uh, foolishly uh, put out these 0% increases when you each year have at least uh, cost of living uh, increases, uh, but you want to look good uh, to the public to say we're giving this 0% uh, increase well, you can do that, and usually they do that by ignoring things like infrastructure. It's in the ground, it's buried, you know, we'll worry about it when the pipe breaks or when we have this, you know, this urgent uh, thing. Um, so in my view, we have to be uh, progressive. We have to always acknowledge that those things uh, are there, even though they may not be visible and may not be a problem right now. We know that they need to be taken care of, and the responsible thing to do is to have modest uh, increases to allow us to address what we know uh, are, are things that exist. Thank you for that. Um, so what I want to do, folks, is kind of pause for a second, recap to you what I'm hearing, partly because I'll be the one working with the staff to kind of um, both walk you through this next portion, but also to, to write something up at the end. So I want to make sure that what I'm hearing reflects accurately what you're hearing. Um, because also part of my job is listening for what I'm not hearing. So what I'm not hearing is I'm not hearing zero from very many people and I'm not hearing huge increases. I'm hearing modest increases necessary, both for the reasons Councillor Hicks just mentioned, cost of living, infrastructure, lots of people commented, you know, things cost more money. But also if there is a need for an enhancement related increase, not just a cost increase related increase, that those enhancements, if any, would need to be really tangibly beneficial to your residents and that we would need to be very clear what those are for so that you could message that appropriately in the community. Um, and so if I'd love your comments in the chat as to, so sorry, all in the context of times are tough and therefore, you know, we've got to be very conscious of COVID and you are, as was mentioned by a couple of you, in the context for many of your communities, if not all of them, populations might be growing and per and certainly housing prices are going up. And so, as was mentioned, you don't have that many levers in terms of increasing revenue. Are we increasing taxes per family, per household, or are we increasing the number of households? So that's a piece that, um, again, strategically invo involves county and province and local, and I get that. But I'm just, I'm curious if you wanna build on what I just summarized in the chat or out loud and say, yes, you got it, no, you don't, I like it except for this. Um, you know, whatever you wanna to say to that, I just want you to be hearing my voice in my head so that you, you can respond back and go, if you wrote that down, you'd have it a little wrong. Um, so love to hear about that. In the meantime, I'm just catching up on the chat. Um, tax increases as investments, I see. Meaford has committed some numbers there. You can see Councillor, Councillor Kenny putting that there in terms of 1% for roads bridge, and bridges, 5.5 for facilities. Um, so taxation is about 38% 30 of revenue. Thanks for Councillor Silver on that. Councillor Silver, can I just ask you to speak into that very briefly of what comprises, you're so good at the numbers quickly in your head, what, are, what comprises the rest of the other 62% if not taxes? Um, the, other, the other percentages, I'm just gonna look at my screen here. Federal and provincial grants are about 39%. Reserve funding is 10%. Uh, 
and other is 13%. And that's according to our um, 20, um, 20 budget numbers and taxation making up 38%. So at the county level, we do receive quite a bit of money from other levels of government. Now that too is taxation, but not anything that we control. And um, obviously it's quite different at the local municipal level where um, taxation and user rates make up about um, 85%. Right, thanks very much for that. Appreciate that context. Um, anything else? I'm seeing that you know growth that can help with increased costs, infrastructure as a priority as an investment return to the community, but not extras. So certainly what I, what I hear both in the comments here and in previous comments made by some of you, this isn't a season for what was called frills earlier, right? I realize that what it would be deemed a frill, it, you know, is debatable by, you know, across any council, there would be diversity of opinion around that. But basically this sense of investment in the future is important too. So we're not looking only at today and therefore we need to keep on top of, you know, ongoing costs going forward. Um, but that, you know, that, that that would be in the modest range. So I do appreciate that. And I'm curious, are you ready to move on to the next question? If so, um, just a quick, you know, thumbs up or nod or something to give me a sense of that. Are we ready to move on? Yeah. Or do you want to linger in the tax conversation any longer? We good to move on? I can see some of you, not all of you. So I'm, the people that have their videos on get, win the day here, right? Because I can see their opinion quicker. If you're able to turn your video on, I, you know, you're welcome to do that. You'll get to weigh in uh, more strongly than the rest because I can see you. Um, okay, so thank you for that. We're gonna do the uh, same thing. Rebecca, yeah, Rebecca it's, it's Councillor Potter. I just wanted to make one very quick comment, which is <clears throat> when we talk about looking at the, uh, the revenue side, we have to look at things like fees and we look, for example, at, at what goes into our landfill and what it costs us to, to deal with that and how much of that money can we recover. And so, for example, things like uh, the construction waste, we raised our fees for that. Uh, and so that the taxpayers are not paying for construction companies to drop off their, their garbage or their construction waste. Uh, so there are ways that you can recover a lot of the costs if you look at the revenue side and not just the spending side. Thank you. So um, as we're looking, because this, this piece of the conversation is the revenue side, we've been talking about different sources of that revenue, growth in population, growth in levy, but also there might be some other fees where you can, um, you know, have user fees and that kind of thing for very targeted to the people that are um, generating those costs to the county. Um, and I'm seeing Warden McQueen's comment about savings and quality and efficiencies and that kind of thing and the way you provide services. So we'll certainly talk about that on the cost side. Any other comments before we move on? All right, I'm gonna move us forward. And as somebody said earlier, I think Councilor Robinson said that things are, are interconnected, right? So we're not treating these as separate. But if we think about the pillars of your current strategy, the second one is around economic growth. And the question we have for you is a, is a pretty general one, but I'm hoping we can get some pretty specific answers to it that fall within um, county jurisdiction, obviously. So the question being, as you can see on the slide deck there, what could we do now to make the biggest difference to the health of our businesses? So assuming that business health is a, is a priority for you inside this economic growth pillar, what are some specific things that the county should be prioritizing to help businesses right now? And we'll go the same way as before. If you've got a comment to make, please say so in the chat. I'll do a little bit of a speaker's list and um, we'll have about a 20 minute conversation on this and then we'll take our first break. Anybody wanna weigh in on business supports? Councillor Milne, start us off. I would suggest that probably the biggest uh, thing we can do is get the heck out of the way. Um, I hear over and over and over again, um, particularly from businesses that want to strike off in a different, di a different direction or expand or, or do something different, that the, uh, the, the classic red tape stuff gets in the way. And it takes so long to get any kind of decision from any government that it just stifles any kind of uh, innovation or entrepreneurship. 
Um, so I think it behooves us, and again, and it goes back to the the question just prior. We need to invest more of our resources into planning, and I know uh, Randy would be happy to hear me say that. Um, to to speed up the cycle of getting an answer or getting a decision back to our businesses so that they can do what they want to do to uh, ensure their own survival or expansion. Thank you. I need to ask a question out of my own ignorance right now, and that is jurisdictionally, I'm assuming that there are planning functions both at the lower tier and at the county level. Is that true? That is true. In both places? Okay, thanks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and we're not short on planning ability here. Clearly. Okay. Um, the reason I was asking is I was working yesterday with a lower tier municipality in the GTA and the conversation veered very strongly into planning the whole time. So I thought, oh, I, we just talked about that yesterday, but it was a different level of government. So I was um, just checking my memory on that. Um, others, who else? Uh, Councilor Robinson, Gary, carry on, please. Hi there, folks. So I agree with uh, Councilor Milne. Um, also, what I would like to see if there's an opportunity to do a review of efficiencies through operational processes and also if there's an opportunity to look at our, our policies, uh, whether they're attached to enabling legislation or whether they're county driven and are there chances or opportunities once again to um, improve customer service to our um, Gray County business folks and uh, residents. Also, I would say um, when posed the question, uh, what's impeding the success of our business, I would say if we could um, work uh, for tangibles in broadband, uh, that would be really great. And a shout out, obviously, to everybody at the county that's dealing with economic development and sustainability and attraction. Every time there's a report that comes on Committee of the Whole, I am absolutely thrilled to see it with the progress and the professionalism of the staff. Thank you. Thanks so much, Councillor Robinson. I missed the last part. You were thrilled to see professional the staff when, professionalism of the staff when you get reports on. I missed what you're writing. Sustainability and... Oh, just, um, just a shout out, really, a positive shout out to the staff working in uh, economic development, uh, sustainab sustainability rather, and attraction. Uh, it's really wonderful when those reports come to Committee of the Whole and we see the uh, positive steps forward that, uh, that we're making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Councillor Silver, for responding to Councillor Desai on that. And we'll add parking as one possibility of, of another fee-based revenue source. Um, Councillor Potter is bringing to our attention the, the notion of making sure we're buying locally uh, if local options exist and promoting local business in your own operations as a municipality. Um, do others want to bring some other ideas to the floor about how to support business health? Councillor Keeveny, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right. Can you say your last name for me? Sorry, you're muted. I apologize. Yes, you do have it right, Rebecca. Thank you for that, Keeveny. And I appreciate the opportunity to just share quickly um, in Meaford uh, some of the uh, history of our recovery task force that has been operational since uh, May, a group of uh, individuals and Chamber of Commerce and BIA and so on that have come together to support our businesses. And I think we've had uh, some considerable excess in getting our patios open and offering e-commerce support to our businesses and any uh, help that they need with uh, grants and so on. And our newest initiative is working towards um, support for our restaurants as the patios close and uh, looking at an opportunity for uh, food delivery in Meaford because we don't have Uber Eats or DoorDash or any of those uh, businesses. So just a, a continued effort to, uh, to support business locally and in looking at uh, their needs through uh, their responses to a survey that, uh, that was uh, sent out to them just a couple of weeks ago and, and taking that information and, and really working with it and, and being open to their needs. Thanks so much. I wanna push into that a little bit before I move over to Councillor McQueen who will be next on the list. Can we talk for a second, just as an example, I'm not trying to privilege one sector over another, but since Councillor Kibney brought it up, from a county level, 
let's, let's lean into the restaurant sector just for a moment. Um, as an example of a local business sector, are there things that the county can be doing to, within its jurisdiction to really support particular sectors? So let's use restaurants as an example. There might be many others, but what are, if, sometimes it helps us to have a specific tangible thing. Is there anything at the county level that could support restaurants in a better way, for example? <laughs> Other than pie, very true. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Councilor Cuny, follow up. Thank you, Rebecca. I think it's just, uh, you know, the promotional piece. And if there's any way, and I think this is more a health unit uh, uh, piece, but of providing some sort of um, encouragement and, and almost a comfort to our residents to let them know that, you know, our restaurants are following all of the protocols and that it is, it is important to support them because we want these businesses to survive the pandemic. And if people don't, uh, you know, make an effort to uh, reach out to these businesses and find out, you know, what they're doing, what their particular protocols are and how they can interact with them. Um, yeah, I think, you know, as we well know, the movement to online shopping is really hurting our local businesses. So how can we, uh, what can we do collectively to promote and, and encourage uh, that support for our local uh, shopkeepers, restaurants, and, and all types of businesses? Great. Thank you very much. And um, following up on what's going on in the, on the chat, love to hear from Savannah on the most recent business survey at the county level. Excellent. Thank you, Council and Rebecca. What we're hearing from businesses uh, is very much the need for support around the promotion and that shop local support, um, but also the need for better broadband. It didn't come out in the first couple surveys, but now it is because we're in a long term uh, work from home, move online, our businesses are moving online. Uh, we've done a lot of support trying to get businesses to look at their uh, operating procedures and and what it looks like now to completely turn your business upside down overnight and keep that going. And broadband now is becoming a, a huge um, a challenge for them because we are in rural Ontario. Uh, so that has definitely been one, but we've been working very hard with our businesses, listening to them. We've had, we're just finishing up the third survey now. So getting ready to bring another report back. So Councillor Robinson, you'll be happy about that <laughs> to know that there will be one coming in November uh, to talk about what we are hearing from businesses and what we've done through the recovery plan over the last six months, uh, because there's been a significant shift. We turned our entire team upside down as well uh, to make sure that we could listen to our businesses even more than we were before and also continuing to work with our working group so that is all of your members uh, from every one of your municipalities along with our provincial representatives and community representatives making sure that all of our eyes and ears are on the ground and listening to business to find out what it is that they need most and they still are not asking for loans from us they are not asking for any of that any grants that are available, which we did make available through the Business Enterprise Center, those went over very, very well to help pivot those businesses and make those transitions more permanent. Um, but now we're really seeing that promotion. So we had Rediscover Gray all summer long. We're going into our, our full marketing campaign now in winter, and it is continuing with that hyperlocal uh, move. So that is what we've been hearing. That's where the struggles really are, and that's what our team's very much committed to continue with. So we'll have uh, more information coming back to you within the next month. Terrific, thanks very much. I see Councillor Patterson has a follow-up question, Savannah, in the chat. It says, can you speak to the capacity of the workforce and do we need to attract more workers right now? And then Councillor Potter, I'll go to you for a question next. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we, we still do not have enough people for the jobs that we have. Um, we really need to keep that focus on. So we are working through our local immigration partnership. We're working on a traction retention campaign. Um, that we had put on hold at the beginning of COVID because things changed so drastically, but we are seeing our unemployment rate is still continuing the lowest in the province, even though it's hovering mid 7% now compared to the 1.9 that it has been at, um, it is still low and between childcare concerns and schooling concerns and transportation concerns and all of the other concerns that haven't gone anywhere. Uh, it's making it much more difficult to get the staff that we need and that skills mismatch is still there. So the labor force development absolutely is a top priority uh, because we just don't have enough folks. And then when you talked about the housing concerns and the housing issues, that's another challenge because we don't have the housing to get them here. Uh, and as we see our numbers rise, 
those numbers are rising so much because we are seeing a lot of influx uh, from outside the area. So it's not locals that are buying those homes. It is people who are moving to the area, which is good news for growing our, our tax base and our assessment base and our labor force, uh, but it's still not enough. So that is definitely something we need to continue on. And I think one thing I did forget to mention, sorry, um, just about the, the promotions that we've done, restaurants um, in particular, because you had asked about that one, have been a key priority for us uh, where they have been a main focus um, because we have amazing restaurants and amazing people here who were really quick to jump and to make sure that they were following protocols and being known as a safe and trusted place. So we've spent a lot of time talking about consumer confidence business confidence because our business owners need to have that confidence to know that they're protecting their staff, that they're protecting the residents and that the residents have the confidence to walk in the door and support local. Um, so it all ties together, but it has been very much a, a key priority for us. And, and you'll see those promotions around and we are hearing that they are working, but now that weather is getting cold or rainy like it is today, uh, our patios are quickly disappearing. Uh, and now we're, we're quite concerned about what the winter looks like and then that cold season looks like. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for that. And I'm noticing Councillor Keveney's follow-up comment there around emotional supports for staff that are struggling. Um, that, that's a, a risk um, as CERB supports change and as people try to return to work and are still figuring out a lot of the uncertainties. Certainly a lot of places across the province are experiencing that. As employers, um, what we're seeing is that people um, are they, made, they basically made short-term concessions to their employees in the springtime thinking this was going to be short. And now they're realizing that the kinds of um, you know, lifestyle flexibility stuff that they were able to do as employers, you know, I know your kids are home, don't worry about it, we'll figure it out kind of stuff, um, becomes increasingly difficult to sustain over the long term at the same time as people's uh, tolerance and energy and well-being is suffering right now. And so you're getting people who need their employers to be even more understanding at a time when employers are saying, we've got mission critical work that isn't happening. So you've got to figure out kind of what it means for employers to be able to be supported to be good employers and maintain that focus on their results that they are accountable for achieving and keeping their doors open. Um, I'm seeing that, I see a comment from, comment from Councillor Hicks around uh, after affirming this focus on broadband capacity rurally. Um, and I see Councillor Body saying, I'm not sure what else we can do. Fair enough. I see Councillor Potter had another question for Savannah, if you don't mind, Savannah. Go ahead, Councillor Potter. Uh, it was actually to do with the broadband. I wondered uh, if you could tell us more about the need for broadband. Are businesses expanding into the countryside? And, uh, you know, this, I just am very much impressed by the fact that we can't wait forever for, for broadband to expand here. Uh, so when, when people ask, well, what more can we do? I think attainable housing and broadband are the two things that we can do most to help our local businesses. It's, it's certainly what we're doing. And I think if we expand that across the county, um, a lot of our businesses could employ more people, but they can't because they don't have the people because they, they just can't live here. Uh, and they also uh, can't expand into the countryside because there's no internet or no broadband. So uh, could you talk a little bit more about the broadband needs uh, beyond the, or the urban areas? Sure, absolutely. It is very much a mix. Uh, our broadband capacity is being limited because we have so many students who are using broadband um, to be at home and to take classes virtually. We have a lot of businesses who were able to work from home or send their staff to work from home. And many don't live in urban centers that do have good broadband connectivity. So it is very much, we are seeing, we've always had this shift where we have really, really good connectivity to none at all. And we saw it when we did the top seven intelligent tour. Um, when we were on the bus tour, we would literally hit dead zones where everything would just go black and you would get the no service bar. And that was, that is our reality uh, because we don't have broadband everywhere. And this after, well, I guess not this afternoon, in a little bit, uh, we'll definitely be talking more about uh, SWIFT and broadband as part of those priority projects. Um, 
but we are seeing a lot of businesses come online and they're not necessarily in the urban centers. They are trying to do remote from home. Uh, they're trying to do a hybrid where you have your typical, uh, your storefront, whether it's in a downtown or you're working elsewhere, and now it's a hybrid where you're physically there and then you're partially at home, just like I am today. Um, and if my video turns off, it's because my internet has gone down as well. So it is really truly that hybrid model, but we certainly are seeing more businesses come on. Our business enterprise center has never been so busy. Uh, the number of people who are interested and used COVID as an opportunity to step back and really think about what they wanted in life and are taking the opportunity to try their hand at entrepreneurship and, and give that a go. So we are seeing a huge shift in that and very much tied to virtual. Great. Thank you, Savannah. Over to Warden McQueen. I apologize that I missed you earlier. Go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. It's, I've been making notes and, and it's all good discussion. Uh, I think I'm going to take my conversation way back uh, to the time when uh, Councillor Millen first spoke about planning. Um, I, I agree with a lot with what he is saying in the sense of duplication and, and uh, how do we make things move forward. And I wonder if we were able to create a flow chart. Uh, one is, and, and more or less two, in, in the roles of, of what the public's part is, uh, staff part, and councillors and mayor's part. So is when we're looking at development and, and that is how do we streamline and, and you know, you go here, you go here and, and, and move things along. And I will say that our county planning staff are very good, they're very helpful. And sometimes you run into these barriers and just, you know, maybe there's a, a flow chart system that we've talked about in Gray Highlands for quite a few years back about, you know, just an understanding of how it works because sometimes people don't always understand that. So maybe there's something we can work on on that part. Uh, going on to the food, I mean, it's the comfort part of our enjoyment in life. You know, we had pies and some tarts pop up there. So, you know, that's the enjoyment part. And, and that services a lot of our businesses that are there. And we very much uh, need to support those restaurants out there. I wonder on the economic side, as, as, an, as another side, is we have a lot of pride here in Gray County. I mean, uh, you know, it's a great spot in the, in the province. We're, we're, we're suited in the right location. Um, I don't know if there's an opportunity for some branding in the sense of not a, a, a logo, but more as communication that we stand at. We talked a little bit about this last year at our strategic plan. So I just wondered if that's something that maybe we can look at in the sense of, you know, years and years back, Vaughn had the city above the city. And that was very, um, very beneficial to Vaughn at that time and stuff. So just some thoughts, you know, and we have to be, you know, we got growth, you know, growth is, is something you have to an anticipate, but you have to have good growth and, and, and growth uh, is, is how we want to see the growth. I just was reading this morning, uh, as, as probably others have read from yesterday, the average price of a home now in Grey Bruce is up to over a half a million dollars, which in one year has increased 20%, uh, which is huge. Um, you know, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's an item in itself. Now that's Grey Bruce, that's not taking part of, of the Blue Mountains surrounding because that's even higher than that, but just, even that just that 20% increase in housing is, is, is huge. So how, how do those that are struggling and, and all that kind of stuff, but on the flip side, um, we have a lot of people, there's a lot of day trippers right now coming to Gray County, um, you know, from that GTA area, GTA area. And I think it's something that we need to embrace and look because they, you know, people are coming here and, and, and how do we want to control that? Or how do we want to enhance it? Or how do we want to take control of that? And I just, those are just some points to, to throw out there. And one last comment, do we need to develop a Gray County or look to review a Gray County lens? You know, what is that? And maybe that goes back to that planning part as well as what we want to see happening here. And I know, you know, Gray Highlands has a bit of a lens and, and I know Gray County is very diverse. And I don't know if there's any thoughts there with, reg with regards to a Gray, 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 Gray County lens. And maybe there's a bit of comments there too. Thank you. Sorry, Warden, I'm going to have to ask you, you were saying Gray County, are you saying lens or lens? What are you saying? Lens, like a lens, like it, it's a planning. Um, Huron County developed it a few years back and it's sort of, it's a bit of a lens that sort of, when you're looking at uh, planning and you're looking at development in your, in your, in your county, there's some, some higher priorities that you give uh, maybe preference to, or it's, it's sort of, 
it's that gray highland gray county lens that's maybe different than maybe um peterborough county or maybe perth county it's it's you know it's sort of developed through the through the politician side in the sense of what do you want to see in in gray county and it's something that we all can use as a guideline of moving forward as far as growth or all different aspects you can include you can include climate change on that there's a lot of different it's a, it's a, it's like a guide a guide but they call it a lens it's a new way of developing i just didn't know you're talking lens like the local health integration networks i'm like whoa how did we get into health all of a sudden no, and not, i no, 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 sec. No, sorry no. i was just catching up thank it's you like a view, it's like a viewfinder it's yeah got it through. yes thank you for that um I'm seeing about timelines, I'm seeing requests for an update on broadband. So we're gonna stay talking about that. There'll be some other um, inputs on, in terms of the project list on, on broadband. But I'm hearing a number of things that what I'd like to do is sort of recap what I'm hearing and then give you a bit of a break. Um, I'm, I'm, I was hearing some issues around internal operational issues at the county around customer service, around accelerating planning um, decision timelines. Um, and then certainly in terms of the areas that are within your jurisdiction to make a difference on the economic side, I was hearing four main things. One around promotions, um, particularly of buying local but they're, and leveraging that local pride. I was hearing lots of questions and issues around broadband and what could creatively be done in that area. Um, labor force attraction and retention and attainable housing. Um, as the areas that that would be um, within your jurisdiction and making sure that you're paying attention to those. So, um, and I'm, I will be capturing obviously the, um, the details that are in the chat as well and we'll obviously incorporate that into the findings. Um, Rebecca, go ahead. Sorry, Rebecca. Just with regard to the customer service, it, if there is an issue, could, could someone please elaborate on that a little bit? It's not something that has been on on my radar and it concerns me. It concerns me if there's a concern. I, I can speak to that, Kim, if, if, if you like. Sure. Um, my comments earlier uh, certainly shouldn't have been construed as, as unhappy with customer service. Uh, the staff oh, do no. a tremendous job. They, they, they deal with the matters, uh, you know, as expeditiously as they can. My comment was more directed to um, I guess perhaps staff are trying to do too much uh, or, or council is asking staff to do too much uh, and staff are overwhelmed. So the, the work they're doing is awesome. Uh, but they, I mean, there's only 24 in a day, right? I yeah. mean, so that's, that's the issue. I think there's, they're just overwhelmed with the amount of demand for service. The service they're doing is awesome but it's not enough, uh, or we're asking them to do too much. That, that right. was my point. Okay, thanks, Brian. Thanks for that. Um, Councillor Robinson, we'll ask you to uh, keep your comment brief and then we're gonna wrap up and take a bit of a break. Go ahead. Thank you, and so noted. Um, continuous improvement and a review of efficiencies just within um, policies and um, programs is all I was looking at. And that just equals really good customer service. Staff are doing a really great job. It's always a continuous, um, improvement um, uh, focus that I think is, is necessary for any corporation. And uh, again, customer service is very good here, but we always want to improve. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Folks, what we're going to do is we're just going to take a brief break right now. Um, and I'm seeing the comments around how much we have on the go. And that's really what the second half of our meeting is going to be about, um, to really be looking at the overall sort of initiatives list and say too much too little what's going on right now both from a cost point of view and from a, a resourcing and workload point of view um, so what i'd like to do is we're going to just take a very brief break right now come back for one question so we've done two we're going to do one more and then we're going to take a slightly longer break and then dive into the project list so this will be just maybe um i've got it's 20 to 11. why don't we take um like seven minutes, like not very long. I'd like to make sure that at 10 2, we can get back started again. Here's my suggestion to you. Uh, if I may respectfully say so, get away from a screen, hydrate and move your body. And I'll see you back in 10 minutes and we'll get started right at 10 2. Thanks very much. Just a reminder to council to please put your videos and your um, audio on uh, mute, please.
All right, folks, if you can hear my voice, it's time for us to uh, reconvene. If you're able to turn back on your video, I'd love to be able to see your smiling faces, if not totally understandable, given our conversation about broadband in particular. Uh, I may win the prize for the most students using my internet right this minute in the house, if anybody can beat four, you win the game. Uh, the, um, are we back? Great. All right, so we're going to push through one more question here, and then we're going to make sure that uh, we're ready to really look at the project list. So where we're at with our final question in this segment is around healthy and connected communities as the third pillar in your strategic plan. Some of these issues have already come up. We'll make sure to address them in the right spots, not too worried about categorizing things right now, but content-wise, the question is this. What should we be attending to today to preserve residents' quality of life for the future? Oh, big question. Um, remember though, that our scope for today is in the next 18 to 24 months, what should County Council be doing? Um, and therefore, is there anything in those 18 to 24 months that you want to do that is very much an investment in the quality of life of the future uh, in your county? So reiterate things if you need to, but if there's any new things that we haven't um, flagged yet, um, would love to hear the kind of um, considerations you're thinking about when you say, what's today's investment in the future looking like? I certainly heard Councillor Desai and others speaking to that, what does, what's down the track for you? And, and so inviting you to lift your gaze a little bit and, um, and think about investment today for future generations and future quality of life. So who wants to get us started on this one? Councillor Mackey, would love to hear from you, get us started. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, when we look at quality of life, uh, the county is in the midst of redevelopment for our long-term care. And there's certainly been talk around our table about uh, campus of care. So I would uh, certainly like to see, uh, you know, the work that's being done in regards to the campus of care for our redevelopment at both Rockwood and uh, at Great Gables. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so sorry, my chat just closed and I lost it. Uh, there we go, Councillor um, Body, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, we're going to be getting climate change uh, coming at us no matter, you know, whether we want to bury our heads or not, it's coming. Uh, waste disposal and all those types of things are going to be huge. Um, trying to get less being uh, going into um, into uh, waste sites and more uh, uh, organic um, <clears throat> use is coming our way no matter what. Um, Meaford just got whacked as Barb has mentioned on uh, waste disposal and that means we're all getting it uh, if we're contracting out. Uh, we've got list X down in uh, Southgate. We've got uh, the Chatsworth um, um, George and Bluff's uh, biodigester. I think we need to work together. This came up from uh, Al Barfit a couple of years ago. We really need to take a huge step to work together on waste management and on organic uh, disposal or organic reuse, however you uh, want to uh, mention it. Um, it's something that I think could be happening very well at the county. We could all be doing our share sort of working together if we can put that together. That's going to affect the climate and uh, the next generation for years to come is probably an important one. Thanks very much. Anyone else want to talk about planning for the future? Councilor Robinson, go ahead. Hi there, thanks for recognizing me. I appreciate it. Really enjoying the discussion. Uh, this far. So thank you to everyone. Um, I like the strategic plan. Uh, goal number two, support healthy and connected communities. And bullet number three, long-term care plan that meets the present and future needs of the people who live in our community. So um, I totally agree uh, with uh, Councillor Mackey's comments. Um, the other point I would like to make is uh, transportation. I think is important. We hear uh, a number of uh, delegations that are County Council that uh, one of the barriers to, um, to employment, uh, to just life in general is transportation and uh, affordable housing, just to name a few. And also on the long range plan for our great county residents, again, long-term care is uh, extremely important. Thank you. 
Great, thanks very much. Um, all righty, over to, uh, I see, just a second, okay. I'll take Councillor Desai first and then Councillor Milne. Thank you. Um, Councillor Robinson uh, touched on, that, on a very good point there with regards to um, tra transportation. Uh, we are a very uh, large, uh, in terms of area, we are a very large county. And I think transportation is key in terms of getting uh, employees from their from their homes to their uh, to their workplace, and it, uh, again, it also helps connect employers to potential employees. Um, the other thing as well, and this this touches a little bit on on lower tier municipalities as well. Uh, infrastructure is going to be huge. Um, we know province wide, uh, all all 400 and some municipalities. Are, are in an infrastructure deficit situation. Um, and so it's going to be huge to preserve um, uh, facilities for the future generations and, and maybe even increase offerings so that we can uh, attract more people to our area. Uh, I, think, I think that's one of the big things as well. Um, and, and that's all I have for now, thank you. Thanks very much. Councillor Milne, over to you. Thank you. Um, I, I think in the near future, uh, most of our residents uh, would be happy to see the county council bearing down and doing the work that needs to be done. Um, agriculture is huge in Gray County, of course, and I, I think we need to be sensitive to that industry uh, in terms of, uh, and some, uh, some others have already mentioned transportation corridors and so on to, uh, to facilitate the marketing of the products of agriculture. And uh, I, I think, uh, again, back to my earlier comments around planning, uh, if we can speed that process up, it would uh, greatly enhance uh, the uh, near term prospects of our businesses uh, uh, profiting. Thank you. Thank you. Ward McQueen. Yeah, just to uh, touch there, I wrote a couple comments about, yeah, uh, looking at our corridors for transportation. but. Attainable housing is very much important, especially if the prices keep going up. I want to give a little tip that I just found out this morning that one of our developers here in Markdale is building townhouses with separate access uh, to the basement, which then allows those, those pr uh, purchasers to create a secondary apartment in those basements. So it's sort of a, it's really a great idea. All I have to do is close off one section and then they create a, a, an apartment or, or a secondary unit. And secondary units are something that we promote through our um, official plan, both at Great County and I know some of the lower tiers as well. I think we need to promote that more because that's, that is another opportunity to create obtainable housing, whether it's for rental, whether it's for, for young people, whenever it's for seniors. It's just, it's a tool that is out there that just, is, is available to people to create and just maybe this just needs more communication. But I, I really thought that was really interesting that the developer was creating that opportunity to have an in, in basement apartment if, if the owner wants to switch it around and do that with a, with a basement uh, access. So. Thanks very much. Just a, a note from some other sort of provincial stuff that I, I'm, in, I'm quite involved in affordable housing issues and what's happening in a number of communities, including ones like your own, where the housing prices, as you've mentioned, have skyrocketed very quickly um, during COVID. Um, their understanding of the housing continuum from you know, affordable rental right through, the snapshot of what that looks like in your community has changed very dramatically in the last three months. Yeah. And so the information that you thought you knew and thought you had about what was already a difficult situation around affordability and attainability of housing, has changed and I don't know the details in Gray County, I just can tell you with assurance that it looks different now than it would have even in July. So um, yeah, just, just, to, add, just to add to that, just to add to that, I was talking to my CAO this morning of Gray Highlands and we had offered an employment uh, position to an individual if they could find a spot to rent. They couldn't find a spot to rent. So we were unable to hire that person because they couldn't get a spot, right? And that's just what's happening out there. And I was just going to say exactly that, sir. The the because rural areas tend not to have the percentage of rental that um, higher density areas have. When the housing prices start swinging upward, there becomes a bigger gap in your continuum than there are in some other communities that have. And I saw one of you mentioned housing diversity. You will probably find that the gaps in your continuum are deeper, wider, in different places than they were 
um, and it was already difficult. So I would really encourage you to stay on top of the current to continuum basically. And because it may offer some new opportunities as the warden mentioned, accessory units might be one. There's, there's lots of ways that other municipalities are, are tackling um, housing in some very interesting ways, repurposing spaces that they haven't before. And one of the good things about COVID ironically is that some of the bureaucracy around that has just fallen away. And so I, I can think of three communities off the top of my head where projects they've been trying to move forward for five years and just you know roadblock after roadblock at all kinds of levels. Um, they're going through because people are just, you know, we can't wait anymore and we have to accelerate this process. And so whether that's using, you know, in some larger communities, repurposing hotels for shelters right through to regulations around parking and tiny houses and accessory apartments and um, container homes and all kinds of different things. But it's a, it's a pretty exciting time to be involved in attainable housing. So I, uh, I would encourage you to look into that a little further if that's an interest of yours. Um, certainly um, over to Councillor Potter now for another comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, it, it's uh, about 10 or 12 years ago now that we released our economic development strategy and our sustainable path document, both of which identified attainable housing and uh, greater housing diversity as priorities. Unfortunately, they weren't priorities for the council of the day. Uh, and this is when I talked earlier about priorities. We have to make up our minds that uh, we need to say yes to the important things and, and put a few things aside now. So attainable housing, we keep hearing about over and over and over again. Infrastructure, we keep hearing about. Uh, these are the things that we really need to put our efforts into uh, if our if we're going to have a sustainable economy here, because without the workers, we aren't going to have businesses. They're going to move and we're all going to be driving somewhere else to, to do everything. Um, so that diversity of housing, that was the word I used, and that's what's missing. We call it the missing middle, uh, the, the starter housing, that when I was young and getting into the housing market, I could buy a house at $90,000, that same house sitting on the same lot has more than quadrupled in value. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not even accounting for, for any work we've done to it. So, you know, we, we have to look at these things. We have to encourage greater diversity. What the warden said about the developer now putting in uh, entrances so that they can have granny apartments as we used to call them. Uh, that is, what we need to start doing. And we need to look at our settlement areas and start uh, looking at more, more intensification. And I think we all know that. I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, these have to be our priorities as we move forward. Thanks very much. Folks, what I'd like to do now, if you don't mind, is I wanna give you 15 minutes to, um, Turn your videos off, turn your mics off, and turn your attention to the materials that were sent your way, inside of which you will see a project list. And while you're looking at that project list, what I'm gonna do is give you a visual that summarizes the conversation that we just had in those three questions that will become kind of like a lens through which to look at that project list, but I'll be developing it concurrently when you're reading it through. So I'm gonna do some writing over on my end while you do some reading on yours for the next 15 minutes or so. And I want to give you a sense of what I'd like you to read for. And I'll put these in the chat as well for you, but I don't know how to type and talk at the same time. So I'll say it and then I will type it. Um, one is, are there any projects on the list that you don't know what they are? And, and we've just given you a little summary title, but you need some detail to go, what does this mean? What are you referring to? So we have to make sure we don't want to take the time to go through project by project only the ones that aren't clear. So if you have any projects that are not clear, um, we'd like you to pay attention to those. And I'd also like you to pay attention to two other things. If you think that there are, in light of the conversation we've just had, projects that are misplaced. So you're gonna notice a list that goes from urgent, important, and underway <laughs> through to important but not yet started. You know, everything's important, right? But we've got urgent, important and underway through to important and not started. If you feel like certain ones are misplaced up or down, we want to talk about that. And we want to talk about the fact that we are over capacity right now. When you were talking about workload and resource capacity, 
the list in front of you is too big. So it's slightly over 100% already without the emerging projects and without anything new that unexpectedly comes your way. So we're also looking um, to say if we were going to trim or in order to really be clear about priorities, um, where might that come from? I want to note for you, I'm going to turn it over to you and your staff in a sec, Kim, just a bit of a heads up to mm -hmm. just urgent. Um, there are lots of ways to prioritize a list of priorities, right? You can have something be a high priority because it's really important to you from a value point of view. You know, Councillor Potter spoke passionately just now about affordable housing, for example. You could have something be priority because, geez, it's underway and we spent a bucket load of money and we got 10% left to do, let's finish her up. You could have something be priority because it has to happen first in order like a domino effect for other things to happen. Um, you know, it might be a priority because there's federal money available and that money won't be available six months from now. So let's take advantage of that, whatever. There's lots of reasons. And so we've got this list sorted right now under urgent and important through to um, not yet started and important. Recognizing though that that urgency or therefore high priority -ness might be in place for a variety of reasons, um, currently from the perspective of, of your CAO and her team. So um, just be thinking about prioritization for lots of important reasons, recognizing that each of us might have a different lens on that. So Kim, if I could just turn it over to you for a moment, just to explain what council is looking at when they look at that list and how things were put in the various categories, then I want to take some time to actually sit down for 10 or 15 minutes and, and have a good solid look at it before we come back and do some work on it for an hour or so. Okay, thanks Rebecca. Everybody hear me okay? Um, so the list of projects that you have here are um, short title, what strategic goals they align with, and some of them align with more than one, um, what, where they are um, from a financial perspective. Um, some of these things um, have grant or other sources of funding associated with them, um, where there's a, a levy impact, uh, that's there as well. The department lead is there. Um, this is very much as we know it right now. So for some of these projects, we totally anticipate that there would be um, other sources of funding, CMHC money potentially around some of the affordable housing builds or towards that campus of care. Um, and those are things that we haven't, we're not there yet to explore those. So um, what we're giving you is the sense of, of, of the financial aspect as we know it right now, but there may be a lot of work still to be done and we can certainly talk about that. Um, as far as urgency goes, part of it is if it's got a specific timeline associated with it. The intercommunity transportation is a very time limited project. We were given some provincial money. We can't carry that money it forward any further than March 31st of, of 2023. The next item, the labor force development, we've classified that as urgent because that's what the business community has told us that it's urgent that we do something to try and assist them in getting the labor force that they need in specific sectors and you know, on like that. So lots of, uh, of discussion here. There are a number of items here um, where there's an, an IT aspect of it. These are productivity enhancements. Because there's so much going, we really need to, I think it's Covey that says sharpen the saw. We need to make sure that we've got the right tools in place so that we can continue to perform for you at the level that we are, or even be able to enhance that. So some of these technology solutions would allow us to do more with the people that we already have in place. Thanks very much. So what I'd suggest we do, it's 10 after. Um, I'd like to give you, I don't know, do you need 15 minutes or does that seem long? Uh, yeah, 15, okay. Let's, um, seems like, yeah, let's take the 15 minutes. So I want you to, so I'm gonna type in the chat what, what the task is, but basically read through the list, process it a little bit in your head, and I'm gonna put the chat um, right in there. So Councillor um, Sober, go ahead with your question. Sorry, you're muted, sir. Sorry. Um, yeah, so if I hear the CAO right, these cost numbers here are not 
the taxation cost. Um, so it's a kind of a blend, like some of these projects may be completely almost DC funded and others, you know, might get other levels of government involved and whatnot. So is that correct? That's correct. What we're, where, irrespective of the, of the source of funds, this is the, the impact of it. So the intercommunity transportation number, for example, that 174 to 244,000, that's the amount of money that it's going to cost us for the life of this project um, over and above what the provincial grant provided to us. Um, the asset management plan, that's the cost of, of the, that particular project. Um, the like long-term, yes. The corridor improvements of 5.9 for 19 and 21. Yes. Is that taxation cost or is that DC's flat taxation? That'd be all in. Okay, so we have a bit of a mixing of. Absolutely. Okay, very good. I just wanted to understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, folks, we're gonna come back at 25 after and that will give us an hour um, during those 15 minutes, if you need a break, drink, stretch, whatever, that's your chance because we won't take another break, but we'll come back and spend an hour really sifting through um, the chart that you're looking at. But I want to give you some time to just not have to worry about the group thing and just get your head into what you're looking at. So we'll um, invite you to turn off your video and microphone and we'll see you at 25 past. Thanks.
Folks, if you can hear my voice, this would be a great time to come on back, get your videos back on and get ready to dive in if you don't mind. Perhaps surprisingly, I don't want to walk through the questions I asked you in order or anything. I want to, I want to go through this in a different way with a couple of warnings. Uh, and you've been amazing at this already, so please do not hear this in any other than a positive tone. And that is, um, you each probably have pet projects on this list, and I get that, we all would. Um, and thank you for right now um, wearing your leader hat and your county hat um, and, and taking that long global and holistic view of things so that we don't um, find ourselves uh, sort of championing any one individual project for any reasons other than that, that it um, speaks to the, the lenses that we were trying to use before. So what I'd like to do is um, I'm going to show you um, a visual that's just a quick summary that of my quick notes um, on uh, what I um, what I summarized of, oh, this is interesting, except it's not showing up. Perhaps if I plug it in, it would be better. <laughs> just a second, we'll try this again. I um, wanted to show you the, um, the summary that I've got going on here. Let's see, sorry, it's trying to find it. Just give me a sec. There we go. Um, okay, let me spotlight this for you so you can see it. Uh, Ah, I'm not allowed to spotlight my, my own camera. Can somebody who's the host spotlight me so people can read my writing? Is that a doable thing? I'll just promote you to a co-host if that works. Oh, thank you. Good to get promoted. Uh, yeah, just want to be able to, to spotlight my video here. Um, sorry, I forgot that they wouldn't let me do this right away. Sorry, I'm not getting any notification about that. Is it, is it, am I supposed to be seeing something? I'm not used to using webinar mode. I'm always in meeting mode on Zoom. It is showing you as a co-host on my end. Great. There we go. Now I can. Perfect. Thanks so much. Okay. It just needs to refresh. All right, folks, what I've got here is um, just a quick summary and that I can keep this visible to you for a few minutes of um, the, what I heard you talking about. So on the revenue side, Perhaps opportunity for a moderate increase, recognizing the constrained times, but also seeing that as an investment to be future ready without things that some of you might consider to be frills, but also there might be some other revenue levers that we've got at our disposal. Not only fees, which I've highlighted here, but also um, growth in terms of residents um, and population, yeah? Uh, under that, under the business supports, I heard you talking about promoting local, and that might be to residents and to day trippers. Um, broadband issues are there, uh, labor force issues are there, housing diversity, and a smaller but important point around advocating to the province around some of these insurance concerns that got raised. In terms of the future quality of life issues that I heard come up, um, long-term care, climate change, diversity of housing, transportation throughout the county, infrastructure deficit issues, a specific mention of how those things could be leveraged to support agriculture and a comment around anti-racism, not just for its own sake, but particularly as it links to being a welcoming place for immigrants, if that is part of your workforce strategy. So there will be more, but I just wanted to leave these things relatively visible to you because this conversation to follow um, ideally will align with these priorities as well as aligning with the strategy that you've developed. So what I wanna do before we dive into item by item is to ask you a question that I have typed in the chat here. Um, and that is this one. What criteria did you notice yourself using as you read through things and went, oh, like your inner voice is always going, oh, I'd bump that one up, I'd move that one down. So for example, Councillor Hicks already weighed in on one, one example. Um, in the comment, you'll see it in the chat there. He's talking about um, what initiatives actually require county involvement? So that would be one criteria. We are needed in that space. What would be another criteria that you would be using? So um, Councillor Potter's mentioned sustainability over time. So Councillor Potter, just to clarify, are you meaning sustainability in all of its forms? Were you thinking green in particular? Were you thinking financial sustainability? What's in your mind about that big term? Somebody once said, I, I can apply the word sustainability to anything, and I can. So yes, economic, when we talk about it, 
it's economic, cultural, social, and uh, of course, ec ecological or environmental. Okay, thanks very much. Other folks, what do you find yourself even casually, sort of not by ca not casually, but like by default? What what are the lenses you're using to assess some of these things? It's good for us to make those explicit and go, oh yeah, that's why I think this one's important. What are some of the things coming to mind? Cost benefit, sure, if we know it, absolutely. What else? I would suggest the degree of impact we can have in the, yeah. in the short term. You know, is it, is it realistic to think that we can turn the ship, so to speak? Thanks for that. So what kind of impact can you have? Um, growth, Councillor Keegan, can I just ask you to expand on that? Is it in, in order to enhance growth in the county? Is that the goal? Um, in a nutshell, yes. In order to uh, attract the residents and the businesses that we need to increase the tax base so that we can complete the projects on the list. Great. And I see quality of life there from a couple of you specifically for particular sectors. Ward McQueen's talking about low, medium, high priority. In fact, that's what I'm asking is what makes something low priority or high priority in your head? Why would something be considered in one category or another? Um, anything else that you wanna kind of bring to the fore and say, this is what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about the importance of these relative projects one to another. Yeah, what are you hearing from the public? So if you could be thinking about some of these kinds of things, um, what I'd like to do, and I'm just going to unspotlight myself just because I feel like I'm larger than life for people. <laughs> it's just a little too much. But if you need to, if you're having trouble reading this, um, or you don't, if you need it, that's fine. We'll send this to you, but it's, you know, it gives you a bit of a, a sense of it. But um, what, if you want to, and you may have already figured this out, but gallery view is your best way to see everybody on the screen. That's in the top right. Um, and I'm also seeing Councillor Carlton talking about how many sectors of our population are affected. Councillor Potter's talking about value, greatest number of people, best, highest purpose, that kind of thing. So as we think about that, let's start first with the list itself. Um, is there anything that needs clarification? Um, budget questions, what's meant by the title, anything like that. Let's start with making sure we understand what we're looking at. Anybody have questions for clarity right now? Good. Okay. Great. Um, in that case, I'm curious about um, looking up in the chat further about some of the things that I asked you to be thinking about. Um, are there are there things that you said? Wow, I wouldn't have thought that was urgent. Let's start there. Is there anything that you saw in an urgent and important category? So one of the first two that you would have said. I'm not sure that I would would have put that as urgent. Um, sorry, Warden McQueen, I just want to double check. One of the criteria is to make criteria is to make sure that what you're doing from a legal point of view is um, with above board, right? Or is, is within your jurisdiction or whatever. Is that what you mean? Uh, no, just in the, on the list, it said legal advice or guidance or yeah, guidance. I wasn't sure what that was for. Great. Can somebody from the staff speak to that? I think now that we've brought in a county solicitor and we're doing this work in-house, many, many of these initiatives require um, that legal overview agreements, that sort of thing. So it's just, it's really just to make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that um, this is, you know, really pretty fundamental to the service delivery is ensuring that we're able to um, provide those that service to the rest of the corporation and that it's appropriately resourced. Thanks. Um, Rob, would we be able to get the, get the actual urgent, I know that's on a couple slides, maybe people are just looking at it, it's better. Folks, I don't know if you'd prefer to look at the person talking or look at the actual document we're talking about, but I'm hoping that you have it there. So I'm seeing a question from Councillor Keeveny about usership of busing, and I've got a question from Councillor Clumpus on road exchanges. So um, again, Kim, I don't know if it's you or one of your folks, but yeah. if we can talk about those two, that would be helpful. 
Um, my understanding uh, with regard to the uh, utilization of the transit routes as it stands, as you know, we phased those in and the, the one that started first on Highway 10 has been running just for one month. Um, Adam's commitment to us was that he would run numbers after a month. So I will have those numbers for you um, at our meeting on October 22nd. Uh, I do know that um, Highway 10, especially the south part of Highway 10, has seen really excellent utilization. I'm not as clear about um, how highway, highway 26 is going, especially it's the one that goes over the weekend, but I will have those numbers for you next week. Thank you. Anything on the road exchanges one or is that part of what you just talked about? Uh, no, uh, the road exchange piece, and I would turn to Pat, uh, Hoy, the Director of Transportation, just to make a comment about what he's hearing from our member municipalities, et cetera, around the road exchanges. George, your loss is going to take number one back, I understand. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that, Brian. You threw me off. But um, <laughs> I think the road exchanges, we kind of listed them in urgent because uh, these have been out there in the TMP for quite a while. And uh, some of them, like I'm specifically thinking, uh, you know, some of the roads in West Gray, there's jobs on those roads that are kind of coming up. Um, and there's jobs on our roads that are coming up. So um, that's where I think the urgency comes from that, uh, we, you know, we have to go through those exchanges and figure out. Um, the, the problem is when we did road exchanges in the past, we would just take a road and give you a different road or maybe not give you a different road. Like, you know, we took on grade 119 with no funding basically and rebuilt the whole thing, right? I don't really want to do that now. Um, I don't. I don't want to sacrifice the rest of our road system to take on roads that we actually should have. Um, the new Gray Road Nine route would be a good one, um, but it's just deciding who's going to get equally underfunded. If that makes sense, you guys have talked a lot about all the infrastructure is underfunded. Every municipality, basically, we get it. Um, we've been trying to work through kind of spreadsheets with exchanges on some of the roads aren't ready to be county roads. And there's a lot that have been added to the TMP since. Like there was a certain number in the TMP, but uh, Blue Mountains has added some, um, uh, Georgian Bluffs has added some, ones that they want us to address. So that's why we think it is fairly urgent to get that process completed. Councillor Potter, did you want to follow up with Pat? Just a question, and, and it relates to all of this, is that Pat, that all fits into the regional transportation strategy. Uh, do we, is that a, an urgent uh, matter for you? I think it's more urgent for us than it is for MTO, um, as far as that goes, it seems like. And like that's a, that's a big ship to turn around, right? Um, so that's kind of something that um, we're going to continue to work on, on uh, try to work with MTO on, and they have been pretty good to sit down with us, but um, it doesn't really affect the exchanges too much. Um, so generally, it, they're kind of running together. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions specifically on why certain things have been deemed urgent that you might not understand the urgency thereof? Go ahead, Councilor Kivney. Can you just hit your space bar for us, please, because you're muted. Sorry, me again, that's why I like to chat. Um, I'm just wondering in relation to the updated asset management plan, if there's a timeline attached to that, is that a provincial requirement or is that uh, internal? Yes, we are required to have an updated asset. All municipalities are required to have an updated mm -hmm. asset management plan um, by July of 2021. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Warden McQueen, did you want to comment on the road system you said? Yes, you know, go, just going back to that, um, I think we have to take a really good look at the next 20 to 25 years out in our road system. Uh, you know, it's, it's good to look at, you know, what's priorities or what makes sense today, but I think we have to look at it, you know, look at just the last few months, how traffic patterns have changed. Uh, is that sustainable? Is that what the future is going to be? Uh, um, you know, I think Gray County is a, is a new found site that people are certainly uh, enjoying to come to and, and, and are making uh, their 
investment here and becoming more permanent here. So what's that look like in the future? And I, I know it's hard to project out where that is, but we certainly got to get MTO to the table and have that bigger question along with, you know, what's happening here. And, and you know, uh, at one time they said, you know, Barry was the fastest growing community in, in Ontario. I'd like to know what's happening, you know, since that, whoever did that study, there's got to be some provincial um, ideas of where that growth is. And I think that that translates down into Gray County itself. So uh, I, I would look at that as a high priority to try to set that at where are we going out 25 years from now. Thanks for that. Um, Councillor Silver was asking a question here, Pat, on the um, transportation master plan timeline. Where are we at on that? Uh, the connecting link um, report should be coming uh, in the next couple months and we're still working on the road exchanges. So they kind of tie together a little bit. There's some overlap there um, because of the master plan, the way it, it, it didn't, it didn't count connecting links and roads that it said were going to be downloaded. So um, there's kind of some, some different things there, but the connecting link one will be coming first. Um, I do think the exchanges is more, uh, it probably is more urgent. Um, just because it, whether the connecting links become, you know, a download, um, like we've, we've kind of looked into just status quo, connecting link or a download. Um, obviously all of them are going to come with money. It's not going to be your classic MTO download that, you know, you're responsible now. Um, or at least that's, that's up to your vote, I guess. But um, we're hoping the connecting link will be the first one to come and that'll kind of get the dominoes falling onto the, then the road exchanges we're working on now. There was a request that the TMP be circulated at some point from Councillor Robinson. Thanks, Pat. Um, okay. So folks, what we're on right now is, our, is asking why certain things might be deemed urgent. And what I want to do, you can continue with that thread if you want, but I also want to flip it and say, was there anything that was considered important but not urgent, so therefore still on the list, but in the lower two categories that you were kind of surprised about? You're like, huh, I would have thought that one should be urgent. Was there anything like that that you wanted to ask about? I guess if I, if I could, um, I, I'm wondering uh, where the province's priorities, uh, you know, fall into this, uh, because that I think will have an impact on what is uh, urgent or important for us as well. Uh, being as we uh, rely so much on upper tier uh, or upper levels of government for funding for some of these. I, I'm thinking specifically homelessness support system. I mean, as a service manager for the province, um, you know, it's, it's a priority um, for sure, but where does it fall in our priority list in regards to funding? Obviously we can't fund the whole thing ourselves. So if the province doesn't deem it a priority in terms of funding, then that makes it difficult for us to push it higher on the list uh, without a huge impact to taxes, which goes back to where we started. Uh, so I'm just, uh, I'd like a little bit of context as to where the province is on some of these things. Are there, so on the one hand, Councillor Milne, I hear you saying that as a, as a criteria, right? For one of the reasons you might bump something up or down would be that if your ability to move something forward was dependent on its positioning in the provincial priority list or the funding availability, therefore, it would bump it up or down. So I'll add that in the criteria list, but I also hear a question saying you'd like to know specifically where something fits in a priority for the province. Are there specific issues that you wanna know about? Would, would you like to talk housing affordability? Because uh, I'm sure any one of these could have a provincial piece or some of them could. Well, so which ones do you wanna ask about? I, I would say this, the ones that are related to social services uh, specifically yeah. are the ones that are most impacted by provincial uh, interest shall we say thank you so much and i'm seeing Anne marie has just shown up are you our social services person Anne marie i'm so, actually director of housing I, but, think. Uh, I can speak to the homelessness part of it um so homelessness is definitely a focus and a priority for the province um and as rebecca alluded to earlier we are seeing significant changes in what our housing and homelessness uh, landscape is looking like locally um we are i did put that on there because we're waiting for our um, funding 
announcements from the province for our continued homelessness funding. Uh, we don't have that yet. Um, March uh, 31st is the end of uh, this fist or this the funding that we do have. We know there will be more, but we also know right now we're running at about a hundred thousand dollar deficit to provide the services that are required in our community, mainly due to COVID. But I also think COVID has highlighted a lot of those that probably were there before too. Um, so I did put that in as an urgent request, especially with winter months coming. Uh, and um, hoping that, you know, maybe that will be a lesser amount um, with uh, when we know provincial funding amounts. Thanks for that. Were there any other follow-up questions on that, Councillor Milner, anyone else? Well, we've got, and right here, other social service folks. Kim, go ahead. The other thing I think that's impacting is there's a relationship here with the federal government as well that, um, Amory, some of these agreements that are between the province and the federal government that will then come down to us are all still still being negotiated is that that's correct? correct that is correct so we are um so for instance our social services relief fund um that is strictly a provincial one but again we are waiting to find out if there are, is money available to repurpose some of the buildings that we have for congregate living um you know whether or not that stays on our urgent list if there is no funding uh, maybe at a lower level, um, but it is a, certainly a, a priority and a need in our community. So, and of course, with the federal government too, there's still negotiations going on with the um, national housing strategy. Uh, we did get years one to three in funding, so we're looking at what is that beyond for the next uh, the next six years. So, a lot of unknowns still in the housing world, but certainly affordable housing and homelessness are huge priorities for the province right now. For that. Um, Thank you. That that covers that well, I think, and then, you know, just it just highlights that there's a lot of moving parts in all of these issues, and you know, all of them impact where it goes on the list, up and down. Yeah. Um, Councillor Cover, I so just like I'm slipping through things. Councillor Silver, I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned recommend a requirement for car share lots with charging stations and new developments. Can you give me some context? Is that something you're saying you think should be more urgent or not urgent enough? What, what about it? Well, as part of the transportation system, we, we need to look at the getting ready for the future. And um, I, I see that, you know, eventually, many years from now, we'll have self-driving cars and everybody might not own a car. And so what we need to do is, as part of our transportation plan is to uh, make sure that we we do allocate um, space for um, you know the changes that we see coming. Like there in a lot of new developments, you see very limited number of parking spaces. But what you start to see in the bigger urban centers now is car sharing, and particularly as the population ages, and you know it gets tighter and tighter on the economics of living here. Um, a car is a big expense. And if you can have a car that you can share with other people, just go get in, punch in the code, drive somewhere. So those kind of infrastructure things, I think we need to consider as part of our transportation plan. Thank you. Councillor Robinson. Thank you. I really appreciate the list and all the hard work that went into this. Um, so thanks to everyone involved in it. it. It really gives a clear path. So the only quick question I have is that we've had a lot of discussion on broadband. Where would that fit into this entire list? Thank you. Thank you. Kim or someone? Yes. Um, well, SWIFT 2.0 um, is on the list and I'm just seeing where it is because it's not, it's on the one of the upcoming um, pages. Um, and right now, there is a great deal of advocacy going uh, forward to try and secure the funding for that. But you can see that should they be successful, Western Wardens um, be successful in securing support for the project, that does come with it um, some significant responsibilities on our part as well to the tune of more than $4 million. Thank you. I just want so to. I just, that. yeah, yeah. Thank I don't you. have an exact. Um, I don't think anybody does has have an exact date when there will be a decision, um, and perhaps Councillor Hicks has more current information on that. Uh, 
so I think you're right, Kim. We, we don't have uh, a date uh, to give, mm -hmm. but know that behind the scenes, the, the climate seems very, very warm uh, for this uh, advocacy and for this discussion. Um, so it is wise for us to, to plan mm -hmm. for it. And just to add there, uh, Madam CEO, uh, the SWIFT 2.0 is to move toward a gigabyte of, hmm. I'm not sure what that, you know, the, the gigabyte much enhanced. and yeah. also, <laughs> yeah, and, and much more, much more uh, toward fiber versus um, wireless. Uh, I, I just wanted to make those two points in there because that's, that's taking it to that next step. <clears throat> yes. Absolutely, and also uh, focusing um, on, on awarding more points and more incentives uh, to projects that will focus on rural uh, and less difficult um, uh, or more difficult to serve uh, populations, those less density, densified areas. Thank you. So folks, before we go into um, um, things that are missing and start talking about capacity, I really do want to make sure that you're comfortable with the ranking in a sense of what you're seeing in front of you. So this is your staff's recommendation in terms of which things they would deem urgent and important versus just important. And you can see which ones have been started and which ones are not yet started. Um, any other comments or sort of assertions at this point on, hey, I really don't think this should be urgent or I really think this other thing should be, or are you feeling now that you've had some clarification on some of these ones, are you feeling generally okay with the, um, with the prioritization of the ones that you see in front of you for the moment. Just a comment, Rebecca. I wonder, because uh, it's gonna consume a lot of time and we continue on this discussion, but is it something that could be sent out to all county councillors that they could, could rate? So then that sort of gets that from everybody. Is that something that could be done? I'm feeling really ignorant in, the question, in my response to the question because I thought I was talking to all the county councillors right now. No, 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 no. But I, what I'm saying is, is maybe not all are, are commenting. And what I'm saying is, is there, is there a paper or electronic form that could also go out? So, so each individually, we could sort of rate them. It's okay. also, so you get, so you get the real data from everyone, not just a few speaking up and some that aren't, that's all. Yeah. I thought you meant sending it to a wider group. I'm like, who else are those people? Okay. Um, great. Yes. I would love to do that. I would. And, and what I, I mean, we, Kim, you and I can chat about yes. sort of how to do that. Um, but what I'll do at a minimum is I will put, um, I realize that you've just seen this and, you know, might need some more processing time and obviously not all of you are taking an opportunity to speak about it right now. Um, but I'm putting my email in the, in the chat right at the moment. Um, obviously you're welcome to send comments to Kim or to me. Um, but if we do decide that there needs to be a more systematic, almost like a survey kind of thing or yes. a different sent out or something we can certainly talk about that but at a minimum if you're like me you'll think of things later today or you know as you're falling asleep or in the shower tomorrow morning you'll think oh I wish I'd said that so um, that there is certainly that opportunity um, for those that need a bit more processing time on this but in the meantime um, is there anything that you'd like to say oh, I'm not loving where it's placed on the list anything like that Um, I just want to echo while we're on that topic, a comment that Councillor Robinson just made. I just want to affirm having seen a bunch of municipalities um, struggle with this kind of exercise. The tool you are looking at takes a bucket load of work to do and is amazingly helpful to you. <laughs> so I'm sure you understand that, but I just want to really affirm the work that the staff has done on short notice to pull something like this together because I'm sure you can appreciate the layers and layers of both conversation and detail that goes underneath it. And uh, I appreciate your trust in them that you're demonstrating by the um, lack of contentiousness of this conversation, because I can assure you that the tone is different than what I've been seeing in recent weeks. Um, thanks for Councillor Silver's comment about careful we're not having an electronic meeting. Uh, another one there from, from Kim around the, the SWIFT RFP. All right, I'm going to move on a little bit then to say, is there anything that is in the emerging list um, that you want to say something about that, that there's those, those few bullets in the, in the emerging projects. Um, I'm not sure, Kim, if you or your team want to give us any context on those few bullets of the things that are kind of, they're not considered um, already approved. They're not in that main table, but they're just underneath it. 
and mm -hmm. um, they might find their way up into the table. And I don't know if council needs to chat about what would happen if they did. Do you want them to like what's mm -hmm. the context for those emerging ones and whether they're going to get bumped up or not? Thanks, Rebecca. So, uh, council, the things that we're aware of. Um, there's the work of the Hanover Owen Sound Task Force, as well as, and I should have maybe put that on here, the work of the Affordable Housing Task Force. Both of those groups are working hard um, to undertake an assessment and to bring back recommendations to Council, but I'm anticipating that there will be projects coming out of those two task for forces that we will need to build into our work plan going forward. We've heard this morning about waste management and sort of separated organics. Um, we know that um, the province has said um, that we're moving to producer responsibility in some form or fashion. Many of you, I think, have responded to that saying, you know, talk to us in 2023. That's when we'll be looking at that. Our estimation is that this is a very significant project. I agree that it could have um, some really important value to all of Gray County, um, but it, it really would be a substantial project and would need to be um, carefully structured and thought through as far as what the appropriate resources would be. Um, Wire and Keppel International Airport is another project that's been brought forward. We know that um, right now, I think, fair to say, Sue, correct me if I'm wrong, but Georgian Bluffs is looking to, you know, secure this as a regional asset, defray by potentially sharing costs with um, Bruce County and Gray, that $200,000 a year that they're responsible for, but then building a future uh, for this really substantial piece of property um, that is going to, you know, make a difference to our economic bottom line. So, We've had, there have been notions of, of policing. So there are always um, pieces coming forward. Um, several years ago, the county did um, sub make a resolution to support a particular process for how to handle um, the upload of services to the county. And I know that um, that has been shared I think amongst the clerks group, as far as um, what's needed there, um, as far as an individual municipality making a resolution in support of a project and then others needing to jump on board. So um, those processes will move forward. I'm just making you aware that uh, we're aware of them and, and should they uh, you know, take on that greater importance, we will need to have a, a good conversation about what that looks like. Just a comment to that. And Madam CEO, just to follow up with that, there, there was a presentation presented, uh, I'm thinking around September 14th, uh, that I attended, uh, the mayor of Georgia and Bluffs did host. Um, is that beneficial at somewhere along the way that that comes to County Council with regards to that wired and Keppel Airport? Or we talked a little bit about that. I don't know if you have anything to follow up on that. Yes, um, Lumex uh, is is coming, the, the airport management authority is coming to talk to council maybe on December 10th, maybe in January. December 10th. Yeah, it is December 10th. Thanks, Savannah. So that's that will be a, an opportunity for council to understand more about what the vision is and determine how they want to engage in moving something forward there. Okay, thanks for that clarity. So folks, it's sounding to me from that overview um, that any one of these three, and certainly if all three, were to be moved into your sort of active list, um, obviously further discussion would be needed, but that they would require, you know, significant um, attention from the county and potentially significant resources of both time and money. Um, and just want to give you a sense that in the list that you're looking at, and I, Kim, I'm gonna turn it over to you in a sec on this. My understanding is the list that you're looking at in the table itself, um, I'm gonna have Kim speak to the amount of capacity that that list represents. So if you left this list exactly as is, didn't add anything, didn't take anything away, this is kind of your 18 to 24 month work plan, how that would measure up with the capacity that you have, both financially and in terms of human talent and time. Um, and then what that would take if those emerging projects were added and sort of where we're at with that. But also I want you council to be thinking about um, 
about if there's anything missing um, from the list that would also need to be added perhaps to an emerging projects list or maybe ongoing projects that didn't get listed here that you were expecting to see. So Council, I'm going to turn to you in a moment around things that you'd like to see added. But first, I'm going to invite Kim to talk about where we're at with kind of a capacity assessment, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you, Rebecca. And really, um, amongst, amongst the staff, and, and COVID's had an impact, right, because that's brought another level of, comp of complexity uh, to the way that we're doing our work. It's brought additional costs to our ability to deliver that work safely um, to people like our long-term care residents and our paramedics. Um, so, but even COVID aside, I think the sense among your, amongst your senior team is that we are really probably running, a, you know, a little bit above that 100% capacity. Um, I don't think that there's been, you know, much in the way of, of people taking vacation this year. Um, so all that kind of stuff has been set aside as we try to, you know, keep things moving forward. Um, so there is some risk to that, that, um, you know, of, as we don't want people to burn out. We know also that, that we've talked about the fact that um, there's some succession planning that's required. We are having some turnover in the, in the senior staff ranks and we need to plan for that. When I talk to the senior team, one of the things that we are in agreement on is that there's a place to consider something around a project management office that um, to kind of restructure ourselves a little bit and looking potentially at an additional resource there that can really help to provide that um, consistency of process and quality control around how projects are structured and communicated and monitored and reported back to you. And so that is something that we'll be um, speaking more about into the 2021 budget. Thank you for that. And I do note the, the comment from uh, Councillor Silver that uh, from the ratepayers watching the live stream, you may want to have a look at that in the chat. Um, so in light of that, and, and Kim and I haven't talked about this, but I suspect that there's some pretty enormous modesty happening right here in terms of if I'm hearing Kim correctly, pre-COVID, the staff was over 100%. And during pro and mid in the midst of COVID, and I'm hearing this from lots of places, you are not alone in this, COVID causes extra cost, it causes extra complexity, and it causes extra stress. And some of those things therefore also feed each other to increase those costs. Mm -hmm. So my guess is if capacity was tight before, it's tighter now. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so I wanna go back to my earlier question, which might be a little bit out of sequence. I probably should have asked it first, I'm sorry, but then we'll come back to this. And that is before we start saying, does anything get taken off this list or at least freed up to be bumped down or anything like that? I'd like to ask about, was there anything that you were surprised not to see that has gotten missed inadvertently um, that you would want to add either to emerging projects or to existing projects? Is anything, any gaps that you're noticing either in ones you know about or in light of um, this list here that you're going to see in big again in a sec? Um, when you look at this written quick summary of our earlier conversation and also just the knowledge you brought into this meeting, is there anything underplayed here or missing that we need to add? I can't see all of you right at the moment. So if you wanna say something, please just speak up. No? Okay. Um, we good? All right, um, that's great, thank you for that. So I would like to turn back to this sort of, this notion of capacity that Kim was just mentioning. Um, what do you think? I mean, we're, we're, we're bringing together a bunch of things, right? We're bringing together COVID context, busy municipality anyway, um, a willingness for some moderate investment, but also moderate, right? Um, and we've got a big list. And so I'm curious, let's spend our last, say, 20 minutes really diving into this and saying, what's your advice to your staff team here um, about how to manage workload and priorities? 
happy to start a speakers list because I'm hoping we'll hear from lots of people on this and frankly hoping we'll hear from a couple of you that we haven't yet heard from today if we could please. Any advice on prioritization, workload management, getting this list a little more under control? Um, Rebecca, it sounds like everybody's is tongue tied here right now, but I just wonder, just as a, just a thought, I, I'm looking at the vision, purpose, and values that we sort of set our organization from. And I think that's sort of your basis. And then you have your, your, your strategic uh, priorities and strat plan. I don't know if you have any comment that, but that's, that's the vision and purpose is, is our guideline of moving forward. That's what we try to tell our rate payers. That's what we're all about. I don't know if you have any thought of that. Maybe that'll get something going. Cause I look at the vision and it says to be a place where people feel genuinely at home and naturally inspired, enjoy an exceptional blend of active, healthy living and economic opportunities. So I could speak that to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if I could make a comment here, I, I think um, one of the things that we observed this summer was the importance of those outside natural areas to people who don't always, you know, who maybe don't have that much access in the place where they normally reside. So they're coming here looking for those opportunities. And then, and what we saw was um, places, outdoor spaces, that really saw a huge influx of people and, an, and a level of utilization that they're really not prepared for. So we haven't talked about it very much. My own personal feeling is that the Gray County forests are a huge, huge asset. And, you know, we try to manage them responsibly. We haven't talked about things like um, the ash borer or um, what it means to have people in different parts of that forest system that, that they aren't really set up for. We've talked a little bit in our tourism strategy about needing to make an investment in tourism infrastructure so that when people come, they can do things like park safely. Um, so in my mind, is there something, if there is an opportunity to do something more, it's around the, um, the care of those forests it's also about water water quality um, and what we're doing around um, shoreline protection um, stormwater management and drainage issues so whether or not every, others feel that the, there's a place for some more conversations about that thanks very much for those possibilities go ahead councillor silver oh sorry councillor potter first and then councillor silver uh, thank you. I go back to my original comment about priorities, and I think we have to, uh, when we look at this list, we need to go into a little more detail and drill down a little deeper. Uh, first of all, we have to know where the where the money comes from to pay for all of these. Does it come from taxation, development charges, fees, whatever? Uh, secondly, we have to look at whether we can uh, do something with our revenues to try and help pay for for it. And finally, I think we have to look at what are the, the optionals versus what are the must do's. Kim just mentioned some things that, that we must do. We must look after the shoreline. We must look after our environment. Um, how much can we, can we manage? Uh, but maybe there are some things that we can put aside. And, and maybe there are some things that we need to re reevaluate whether what we have here is the best way to do it uh, because maybe there are better ways. Maybe we have local uh, firms that could do things better than, than say a, a larger provincial program or, or semi-provincial. So maybe we need to look at the way we're delivering service and figuring out whether that's the, the most efficient way. But, but certainly we need to see more detail on all of these items uh, in order to make decisions about where they belong. Thank you for that. And I just want to follow up on that, folks, for all of your benefit. I think um, picking up on Councillor Potter's comments about things that are, are must do versus optional, I think that's, and, and I think Warden McQueen talked about it earlier about things that are low, medium, and high priority. That's really the crux of this conversation, isn't it? Of, of figuring out which things fall in which categories and also how much agreement there is across this 
room of if we were each to categorize these things, how similar would our categories be to each other? Um, and so that's the kind of guidance that staff's looking for today is if there's anything that you're looking at on this existing table that's in front of you and saying, oh yeah, you know, now that Kim mentioned forests and shoreline, yep, let's add that in. Well, if we keep adding and adding, your capacity assessment gets even more out of whack than it already is, right? So fair enough, it is a bit of a zero sum game right now in terms of with existing resources, if you add something needs to give and probably more needs to give than what you add to bring that capacity assessment down or there need to be extra resources and so i hear councillor potter's comment about we need more detail about where's the money coming from what are our growth projections are there more revenue sources we don't know about i get that but in general if you're seeing anything on the list that you say i think that might fall into a lower priority right now we didn't think so before no judgment attached to that at all but we think we can bump it down this would be a good time to say so. I'm noticing we have Councillor Silver first. If, if I can just, uh, Rebecca, if I could just, mm -hmm. uh, a quick follow up. Yep. That is actually what I was trying to get at was that we need to build these priorities. But secondly, we do have that last item, COVID. And there are a lot of things in there that are not optional for us. So we can't forget that as we, as we look ahead. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, also comment from Councillor Keeveny in the chat about a full service delivery review. So you're welcome to comment about that. But first I see, um, I see Councillor Silver wants to make a comment and then also Councillor Robinson. Yes, um, I, I would agree with Councillor Potter. There are things we need to do. And also with Kim, one of the urgent things that I think we need to do, particularly with COVID is, is manage are people using our open spaces. We're, we're getting a lot of people in places. We don't have parking lots. We don't have washroom facilities. We don't have, and we could have sent hundreds of thousands of tourists to other parts of Gray County from the village at Blue this, went this summer if there was an app that just basically identified where there were parking lots if we have the parking lots, of course, but if we if we have parking lots with electronic, um, you know, monitoring and everything else, and we charge for the paid parking, so it pays for itself. It doesn't need to be an added cost. I know Tobermory, I think, pulls in 500000 a year from parking in one little area. Um, and because the village was turning people away because they were forced to be at capacity. Those people just spread out into the rest of the town of Blue Mountains, but they didn't really know where to go except from Google. And they parked on the roads and there were no washrooms. And some of them went floating down the Beaver River and um, they entered in Gray Highlands and came out on our, our end. Um, but again, there were no facilities, parking lots. People didn't know where to go. Those areas got overcrowded as well it would have been great to send them to other parts of Gray County and other businesses in other parts of Gray County, but to spread them out so that they're managed with, so you identify where is their capacity and where isn't their capacity. So when an area gets over overrun, you just say it's full, don't go there. Um, so that is something we need to do. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's going to be important in the future is, is how do we, the people will come regardless. And we, we hear a lot from, from certain segments of our community that, well, stop them from coming. Well, there's no way to do that. The, we just have to manage them when they get here and, um, and then derive the maximum benefit with the lowest risk. And, and the way we can do that is, is put, some of this infrastructure in place. And I think that should be a priority. Thank you for that. Um, I just put a question in the chat. For those of you that haven't had an opportunity to comment or those that have, I would love to see um, comments in the chat about this because I the chat is our way to hear from lots of people in a short time. So that's why I'm putting it there, but I'm happy to continue the conversation here as well. Um, Councillor Robinson, I think you were next. I thank you very much. I just wanted to um, amplify one of the comments in the chat that uh, Warden McQueen has, and that is perhaps there are some of the items in the uh, key projects, urgent, important, and underway listing that could be pushed uh, beyond the 
18 to 24 months. Um, now that's barring any uh, timelines with uh, commitments to contracts or uh, of funding. Um, I certainly respect that. So they're wondering if that's a consideration. So big question mark. And also would forestry and um, like water protection fall under a climate action plan? Wondering if that could be bundled together. Um, just looking for comments on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to sort of pick up on one piece of what Councillor Robinson said. It's really hard to say, oh, we should take something off a list, right? Because as you've seen from the headings that the team put on the list, everything here is important and you feel a little bit like you're, you know, choosing amongst your kids or something. So some of the ways that make that more palatable would be not saying we're not doing it, but saying we're doing it slower, we're doing it later. Um, you know, so it's not necessarily a this isn't important. It's a this can't happen as a high priority in the next 18 to 24 months. So that's the kind of input we're looking for there. And um, yeah, noted what Councillor Robinson just said that perhaps under when you look at the quality of life category of, um, of climate change, perhaps there is a climate action plan into which forest rent management and water quality management shoreline management would fall. Thank you for that. Yes, um, I'm seeing uh, I'm, no, I'm just sort of catching up with the chat for just a moment. Savannah, I will come to you in just a sec. Um, and so Councillor Mackey is asking a question as well. Um, and I'm not sure you're gonna be able to address this Savannah for somebody else, but the question around with this $100 million price tag, what kind of money are we expecting from other sources? And um, is the GSCA, is that a conservation authority? Yes. Yeah. Um, has the same capacity issues. So talking about parking and following up on Councillor Silver's comments. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Savannah and then we'll go to Councillor um, Milne, sorry, Savannah first. And then if, if, if you're not able to answer Councillor Mackey's question, Savannah, I'll go to someone who is. I will do that. Yeah, that won't be me. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Perfect. All right, I just, Savannah, you start us off. Thanks. I just wanted to touch on the capacity side and say that this is a conversation that we've been having with the working group since March. Uh, we've been very connected to the OPP and all of our emergency services in the area, along with public health, working very closely with all of our conservation authorities. And we have a regular weekly meeting with Blue Mountain Village Association to talk specifically about this. And that is where our outdoor activity map came from over the summer to help with that capacity so that they had access uh, to a GIS map that would say exactly what was open, what was closed, what we suggested you avoid because we were hearing from our conservation authorities that they were overrun. So we were very quick to get that information out there. For 2021, we are definitely making this a priority in tourism. Uh, it's something that we have basically reallocated almost all of our attention towards is the tourism infrastructure and investment side of things and making sure that we are working closely with those trail groups, with the landowners, with the conservation authorities to be able to look at this capacity issue because it's not gonna go anywhere. And we know coming up on winter, we are going to expect even higher capacities um, coming because nobody can go elsewhere to ski. They're coming here. So what do we do to work with our golf courses and with our other businesses around and places who do have large parking lots to see what we can do about other outdoor activities uh, as we do go forward. So I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't lost that we are working regularly with all of these groups and that's not going to stop. It's becoming even more permanent as we go forward. So just wanted to flag that. Thank you, Savannah. Over to you, Kim, for the comment around the um, federal provincial revenue stuff. Yes, well, and some of that is uh, very much still to be determined. Um, we know that uh, there are CMHA is working on housing money, but haven't been able to release all of the details of that just yet. So that could have some impact, certainly with the long term care, what we're um, the, the facilities that themselves like Rockwood Terrace redevelopment, we know uh, we're estimating what that's going to cost us. We'll be responsible for only 40% of those costs because the remainder will come through the provincial funding. Um, so if, the, if that helps with some context, but certainly um, I, I do have a much more detailed spreadsheet with these projects, et cetera. And so um, if there's interest in council in um, seeing that more expanded list and some more details around the financials of that, certainly we can provide that to you as part of the follow-up to today's work. Thank you for that. Uh, so if I'm remembering correctly, I think that we are on Councillor Milne. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Uh, the comment about 
you know, it's difficult to take things off the list. It is and it isn't. Um, you know, you, you look at something like uh, the Durham paramedic base there, the new one. Um, you know, and I'm certainly not trying to peck on paramedic services, but the reality is that that paramedic base has served us well over the years, many years, and it's functional. It's, it's not as nice as the one at, uh, at the one at Chatsworth, I'm sure, because it's brand new. But the reality is that it works and it's fine. So take it off the list if it's not, you know, something we can afford now. It's a matter of what do we want and what do we need? Uh, it's almost like, uh, I think I heard the comment earlier, dealing with your kids. You know, the kids want everything, but they only need what they're getting. So, uh, yeah, it's not easy. Uh, I look at a few of them, you know, there's the ta traffic calming pilot. Um, you know, there's a two or three things there for software ordering system. Yeah. I mean, those are things that we, yeah, we want and that would make our lives maybe a little bit better or easier, but the reality is that what we're using now works and it's paid for probably. So the best, uh, the best farm equipment I've got here is the farm equipment that's paid for. Uh, so, it, it's easy and it isn't to take things off the list. Thank you for that. And we, I'd certainly welcome other comments around, I, I hear people talking about ways to enhance capacity. So that could be growth in revenue. That could be um, timeline issues. I see Councillor, I see Warden McQueen's comment about going for a Chevy and Ford versus a Cadillac or Lincoln. I think we have to use a Tesla now. I'm pretty sure that that's the new thing. I, t I, I used a Cadillac example with my kids the other day and they didn't know what I was talking about. Um, but, uh, you know, is there a quality compromise that says we don't have the resources for it to be that uh, high end version, but we're good with the, the moderate range stuff. And then also, as Councillor Milne has said, there may be some things that we actually have to say not high priority. And the the staff are welcoming council input on that. It may not be in this forum. If you'd prefer to make that known in other ways, um, that would be really helpful because we do need to know that. And I see also what Councillor Potter is saying that you might be in a better position to make those comments with more information. But some of you might say more detail is not going to help us at this point. More detail is actually going to make this noisier. Different. And so um, if you're feeling that, but you're reluctant to say in this forum what you think you want to um, shrink, uh, we do need to hear it in some way because um, simply saying we need to shrink the list isn't going to get it shrunk, right? So um, anybody else that has any comments on that, you're welcome to. Councillor Robinson, I see you're going to put your comment in the chat. You're welcome to, but if you want to say it, you can also do that. Okay, thank you. I, I uh, was trying to quickly type it yeah, before you, you called ahead. upon me. I was just wondering if there was merit to have a description on these projects. Uh, if that is too much of a, a workload issue, um, uh, then obviously uh, disregard my comment. But if, um, if we're getting additional information uh, in a package, could we possibly get a little more detail on the description of the projects? Yes. Thanks. And that information is available. And so when, I, when we bring the report back, we'll make sure that um, you are seeing that as well as what the additional information that you've asked for around the financials. Um, and I think also we'll put something in that's very specific about whether or not there's a, a regulatory or some other contractual commitment to the project that means that there's really not a decision to be made here. And that should maybe um, uh, narrow down the field a little bit for you, make it a little bit easier to see where there's flex. Thank you. I'm noticing that Warden McQueen has a comment. You can go next. And then Councillor Carlton also had a question regarding budget implications of whether savings in one area actually do or don't affect savings in another. So Warden McQueen, over to you first. So this is a little bit more high level in the sense that uh, as we started off the day's process, we're looking at 18, 24 months, sort of this term of council, generally saying each term of council is four years. And and certainly the conversation around what are we going to try to achieve or set the, the wheels in motion for this term of council. I guess the other thing is it, that sort of is a, a bit of a game changer that we sort of ran into was almost seven months ago and it was COVID. We didn't see that one coming. And sometimes when you have a, a list of priorities, sometimes other things come, come at you and all of a sudden you have to adjust. And it's, it's a living document and, 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 and that's sort of as we move forward. And I, and I, 
I think this, hopefully this has been a, a start of a good exercise for staff to try to give them some guidance. And I understand that we need to do that um, very much so, so they know what their direction is. I guess to you, Rebecca, obviously you mentioned at the beginning here a little bit about having conversations with other municipalities. Uh, they keep telling us this pandemic is going to be in place maybe for a year, maybe up to two years. I guess the thing is, is what's the unseeable thing that we don't know about is coming down the road as far as the cost and expense. And I guess I'm not asking you, do you have any insight for us on that part of, should we keep this little bit of a uh, fund here to the side just in case, because it can, it's, as we have seen in the last seven months, it's taken many, we're in a second wave. We don't know what that's going. We see, we see certain areas of the provinces that is, going the other way which affects local business which could have you know happening here so and it goes back to taxation and the ability for people to pay their taxes and all those different things so there's so many different variables there and I guess just as a, a little summary from your part uh, do you have any advice to us from what you're picking up yeah thank you for asking um, I don't have specific advice in terms of oh watch for this but I would say that your comment around um, a, what I'm calling absorptive capacity or just a little extra buffer isn't a bad idea. And I say that for, I mean, it's always a good thing, right? But, but for a couple of reasons, I think there's always, anytime any system is running at 110%, you get nervous, right? Um, because any shot yes. of that system, you have no margin. And so just anyway, I would say that COVID was on top of that. So when I hear a CAO say, I was already maxed out and we're adding, I hear, oh, there's no space. And we all know from COVID, uh, it has revealed to us something that was always true, and that is that we don't have full control over the universe, right? And um, I think people are a little more aware of that now than they were before, and they're, and they're a little gun shy and going, oh, the world can turn upside down. We didn't see that coming, and it's quite likely that we don't see other things coming because, you know, who would have thought, and you can fill in the blank however you want. So I... I think, I mean, you may have a bit of an out here because once you have your growth projections in place, I have no way of gauging from this conversation whether those extra user fees and extra tax base that's coming in from how, higher um, assessments for housing prices and stuff, maybe you can find. But I think when you get, if you get requests from your staff to grow resources, please understand why, because you don't want a machine running at 110, 120% all the time. So I can't predict what's coming, but I would say build in a buffer. Um, and I'm seeing it mostly, it's true for any good corporation, you know that, but I think it's also very true from a staff retention point of view. I am seeing across my business and I'm working with, I don't know, I think 27 different clients right at the moment and probably 50 over the course of the year. So it's not a million, but it's not three. Um, all of them have turn and Kim mentioned this too. They are all having turnover issues they were not having before. They have people taking leaves. They have kids, people's kids are out of school because of whatever reasons that, you know, somebody has a scare in their class and all of a sudden the whole class is doing online school for two weeks, three times a semester. And it's really hard for business continuity. And if you have no excess space, who covers for that person when they're not there? So I think just from a general sort of management point of view, a little more buffer is better than less at this point. Um, yeah, I was thinking on the human resource side. The human resource side is so important to us. I think it's really huge. I'm actually going to put a thing in the chat um, if it's of any, any interest. I mentioned a book earlier um, that's a bit on, it's a, on large corporations. Well, it's not only corporations, but organizations coping with COVID. It's got a bit of a global view to it. If that's of any interest to you, I've got it there for you. It's available on Kindle. You don't need a Kindle app. You just need to download it. I think the paperback is available, but I think it's hard to get in Canada still because it's an Australian book and it comes through Amazon in the States and they don't send to Canada right now, apparently, weirdly. Anyway, if you're interested in kind of how to cope with COVID stuff, that's a new title that just came out last Thursday. Um, Councillor Carlton had a question. Um, not sure, Kim, if you're able to speak to that, it's in the chat. And then I want to wrap things up and honor your time today. So Councillor Carrollton's question, do all items come from separate areas of the budget meeting? Eliminating an item from the list may not have an impact on the workload of the rest of the list. I think there's certainly some truth to that, Sue. Um, and it is um, something that, I don't know, I could put some thought into um, 
when I bring the follow up group list about um, the, that impact question that we talked about, either impact um, internally uh, to county and also externally um, back out to the public. If there's a, a if there's a way to uh, differentiate projects on that basis, I'll put some thought into that and see if there's a way to uh, help you there. Because certainly you're absolutely correct that there are some things that are very, very specific, and uh, and other things that are are really pretty broad based. Thank you, folks. I hope that you found that this has been a useful session, and I say that to council and to staff who are present. Thank you for your time this morning, and I hope that it's been. Um, time well spent. Um, certainly from my perspective as an outsider, I'm honored to have been part of it with you. And also I do feel like that it was a, a really, um, yeah, productive conversation respectfully held. And I really do very, very much appreciate that. So I'll turn it back to Kim and uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Rebecca. So council, as we've discussed, the next steps are uh, to, to you know, bring together all of the information that we've talked about today. There'll be a follow-up report that um, comes to council. Um, likely will be the, um, the first meeting in November. Um, and then we can take it from there in our discussions. I'd really like to thank Rebecca for her time. She came into this on very short notice and it's been wonderful to work with you. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And now I can turn it back to Warden McQueen. End the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Madam CEO. And I will echo your comments to Rebecca and thank you very much uh, for the thought provoking. And that's what you, you know, part of your job was is to pull out what you needed to do. And hopefully it was that, that was there. And, and I guess just following up, Madam CEO, about sending out uh, an opportunity for to make comments and also yeah. there's that email to Re yeah. Rebecca yourself. Um, I guess the question is, is there any last comments from any county councillors before we adjourn? Okay, hearing none, I do need a motion. I don't have it, uh, I wasn't provided, I don't think. So do, would somebody like to move and second a motion? I'll move, you? Mr. Warden. I'll say, okay, moved by Councillor Desai and second by? Uh, uh, Councillor Potter. Councillor Potter. Good okay, to hear that Desai's still awake. I thought maybe he'd left us. <laughs> I would no never leave there. you, Councillor Mill. <laughs> People we haven't heard from all morning are like, I'll move that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks all. Really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Rebecca. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And I, and I don't, I don't hear nobody opposed to adjourning. So we're adjourned. And uh, again, thank you everyone. And thank you, Rebecca and staff and uh, have a, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye for now.